Uh, good evening, Mayor and Trustees. Uh, Cody Bird, Planning Director. Um, I think this is just kind of an informal discussion. I think the the purpose behind this, and it's been on agenda or ideas in the past. Um, what staff prepared was a, a little bit of a kind of a bullet point summary of what staff, at least your current staff, recalled as to kind of a timeline of events and what had kind of happened regarding the Timig property on Sixth Street. Um, Timig being the name of the former owners of the family farm um, land being donated to Wellington Community Church, who's an owner of some of that property, and the town and the Boys and Girls Club um, also jointly own uh, a portion of that property. Um, there's some more background in the in the bullet points in your staff report, but largely what we're trying to do is give you a little bit of context as to where the property is at. It's about 27 acres in size. It's on an arterial uh, corridor um, with a mix of uses around it and three um, non-profit semi-governmental or governmental entities that own this property, each of which has desired futures and have plans and we don't always get an opportunity to speak together. So the idea was, let's take that opportunity um, to have a conversation about what the property is, what it means to each of the organizations and see if there's a, some commonalities that we can kind of advance plans and, and help each other out uh, in terms of what we could do with that. Um, by way of quick introductions, Pete Meyer is here tonight um, representing the Boys and Girls Club of Larimer County. Um, Russ Brewer from Wellington Community Church and Eric Hayes. Hayes, thank you from Wellington Community Church, um, are here to kind of share their thoughts and background experiences as well. So with that kind of brief introduction, I think we'd like to hear from our other partners as well as from our board on options for what we might move forward on this property. In a, in a perfect world, we'd be sitting in a U-shape and be able to have a dialogue, but since we had to have this on a regular meeting night, this is what we've got, so. Um, <laughs> sure. So, you know, this, like we had, like Cody referenced, um, we would like for this to be somewhat of an open discussion about what um, if you have ideas about what you want to do with the property, um, we have received some interest in potentially purchase of the property, things like that. So want to make sure that everyone's on the same page as we start moving forward. If, if the direction is to move forward with it, potentially negotiations or anything like that. Um, so I don't know what y'all's vision was for um, the property. I've I've been here for a little over a year. I've heard bits and pieces, but have never heard from you all of what your thoughts were and, and what your intent was with the property. So would love to open it up. If you'd like to go to the podium and um, just talk about it a little bit, that would be great. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You're the one that's nodding the most, so you get elected. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Russ Brewer, uh, Senior Pastor of Wellington Community Church. I've been here for eight and a half years. And so in terms of intent, do we want to know the, the story or just the intent? The, the, the story is, is a, a multi-chaptered chapter uh, account. What do we think? Trustees, what would you like? I want to hear the story. You want to hear the story? <laughs> All right. So our church was, I'm not going to go, I'm going to begin, go to the beginning, but it's not going to be very long. Um, the, big, the church began uh, in 1915. Our current building was built in 1907. Somewhere in the first decade or two, the Timigs began to attend our church. I can't remember their names off the top of my head, but they began attending, we'll say 1920 to 1930, somewhere in that range. And so they attended for all these years. And well before I got to the churches, I came in 2014, and well before then, um, they had uh, those who had been part of the church had passed away, moved on, and had this property in town. In fact, if anybody's been around longer than I have, they may know how the property was used. I've never seen it in use. I've only seen it looking the way it is currently right now. And so um, they proceeded to to in their um, divestiture of the property. I'm not entirely sure how that came about. They wrote in the contract that the person they sold it to that they would 
develop the property and sell it to us for $10,000 an acre. And it'd be developed property with, with water, electric, things like that. So we went ahead and we're all excited. This is all, again, 10 years before I got here. So we're looking at maybe 20 years ago, in, in ballpark numbers, 15 years ago, something like that. And so um, they, um, then 2008 came along. And so the construction company that bought it was not able to um, develop it from what I understand properly because of the downturn of the economy. And yet our church still wanted the, the acreage. And so um, a difficult legal discussion ensued. We ended up buying it undeveloped for $10,000 an acre. And so we spent ballparkish $90,000 to $100,000 on that property. Not that much longer after that, the previous senior pastor then moves on. We'll say, um, well, he definitely moved on in 2012, December 2012. So it was probably 29, 2010 or so um, that this all happened. So he moved on. And then when they were sending out their, um, their listing for, for a pastor, they were including the discussion, the future pastor will be building a church on that property. Um, I have been loosely a part of a, maybe loosely is the wrong word, heavily might be a better way of saying it, heavily part of a church construction project in the past. So I had that on my resume. And so coming on out, they're, I'm flying in from New Jersey. They're taking me over to that property. They're showing me saying, this will be our future church one day. And we're looking to you to develop this property. And having, we didn't, I didn't actually develop, but I was a part of a, a major purchase, a multi-million dollar facility and, and that whole process. So was excited. So I come on out and probably around 2015, 2016, um, we're talking with the town about something, I can't remember what it was, but it, we get word that the town is not really wanting us to build a church on that property because that is prime commercial real estate for the town. And I think anybody who is reasonable can hear that and understand that. And so we um, we had meetings on our own uh, to discuss, um, well, the town doesn't want that going to a church anymore. And so somewhere along the way, we began to disconnect from the idea that that was going to be our future home. And so at that point, then Mayor Hammond got wind, I think, I think this is just Russ's opinion, <laughs> but he got wind that there was some of this, like this communication, we don't want you to build a church there. And so I think he was able to influence a discussion back to you could build a church there if you put in sewer, water, things like that, widening the road, things like that. You're talking about we're, we're a church of 100 ish, 150 people. That's a quite a big bill for the town as well. And I think the phrase was what was the phrase? Something like um, I can't remember the term. Is you guys probably know the term, but those who are using the property are the ones who develop all the everything, the infrastructure going into it. So that wasn't gonna work for us. And so um, being that the town didn't really want it to be a church anyway, cause that was quite clear. And also, even though they pulled back, um, it makes sense that that would be a great location for commercial property. So we had a church consulting come on out and we took him to our various properties and said, what do you think we should do? And he's, he said, I think you should go look at that rice property. What we call the rice property, property right by Rice Elementary. And so we went ahead, began looking at it, and he kind of um, helped us understand how we could take the Sixth Street property, sell it, use that money to then buy and build on the Rice property. Uh, so that's more or less what we did. That was um, around three to four years ago. Oh, along the same time, the Boys and Girls Club, these, these good folks, um, knock on our door and say, can I just summarize, say, can we buy your church and let you stay here? And we were like, well, this, this, this all works together for us. And so, um, cause the town wanted to have the boys and girls club released from the current, their old location, come to someplace else. It made sense that in, when you think about the purpose of a church, a church and a boys and girls club, maybe a, a slightly different uh, mission statement, but in terms of function, not a whole lot different. And so it seemed like a good fit for us. So we then took the proceeds of that. And so then we came back to the town and said to the town, um, well, we got a small problem because it's transitional zoning and it's not showing up in any, any listings. You know, the, the developer for Walgreens doesn't say, show me all the transitional property that I can 
buy in America. He's looking for commercial, she's looking for commercial property. So um, we asked to have that transitional uh, zoning change to commercial zoning. Cody was a huge, huge part of those discussions. And uh, that was voted down. Um, and so it has been sitting for us now for about four years and we've had effectively no tire kickers because it doesn't show up on people's listings and it's an awful big ask to say to, to a Walgreens based out of Chicago or wherever they're based out of, hey, would you develop, buy and develop our property? And so we would love to see it sold. We, we, we are waiting for that property to sell because we can't build at the, the what we call the rice property until that property sells, we need the money from it. And um, the only qualification would be that the Timigs, these are good folks who love the Lord. And so we're gonna wanna see it go to something that is relatively within the scope of what they would approve. We're not gonna run it by them. They've, they've moved on, but we wanna honor their intent. They wanted it to go to the Lord's work. And so there's probably a few organizations and things we wouldn't wanna see. Um, things specifically like Planned Parenthood, uh, dispensary, a liquor shop, and that's almost about it. You know, we talked with Cody about this. Listen, we're not saying we want to have a huge um, uh, ability to turn down things, just recognizing that there are some things that would be outside of the scope of what a church would want its property going to. So that's more or less our intent. If you have any questions, and if I'm, if I'm wrong or anything, that's, these are Russ's opinions. Um, so <laughs> if factually you found out I'm wrong, um, that's my understanding, uh, and that's where we stand. Thank you. I think that's kind of what we were looking for. Um, and um, we can talk later. Would you have anything to offer from the Boys and Girls Club side? I don't have a, a ton to offer. Um, <laughs> I'm Peter Meyer. I'm president of the board for the Boys and Girls Club of Laramie County. Um, been involved with this called a project for a number of years. Helped with conversations with the church early on and oversaw the construction of, of our new facility when we moved in. Um, but it, we had intended to build a new building on the property we're discussing. There actually were drawings done. They were in, they were collaborated with a new, we'll call it a town administration building, I believe. Um, and that just could not get worked out. So what our intention now is to sell that property. Um, so my thanks for sharing that. I didn't want to speak for you. I appreciate um, recounting some of those those um, occurrences in the history. Um, some of the conversations that I've been involved in as well. Um, I agree with what Pastor Brewer was saying about, you know, is this property a prime location for commercial development? Uh, from a planning and zoning and development standpoint, I think absolutely it is. Um, speaking to some of the desirable or less desirable uses for that location also point out and there's a location map in your packet just to kind of help orient you it's right across from from an elementary school um, so from a community standpoint I think I would feel the same way I think many of our community members would feel the same way as well in addition to there's some legalities regarding buffer distances for liquor licenses uh, dispensary licenses adult establishments there's a, there's a several things there that the school itself actually prevents those things um, but I 100% agree with the intent um, from the church that they've expressed. And um, to what, what Pete had said as well, um, I, I, failed, I failed to mention that. So thank you for the reminder that the town portion of this had been considered at one point for a future town hall site. Um, and I put a couple of bullet points in your staff report kind of outlining some of the things that have taken place there um, and including that the town has undertaken Kind of a, a program for what what kind of a footprint would a future town hall need what were the space constraints and what were some of the programmatic elements for a desirable site and largely that conversation not all of the board members were involved in that after we've had an election with some turnover um, but in large part that kind of concluded with this might not be the, the right location for a town hall and so we're all kind of left with the same every every group had future plans for what that site was going to be used for. And so far, none of those plans have come to fruition. And so what do we do next? Um, I 100% agree with the comment that was made about 
um, a, approximately 10 acre parcel that the Wellington Community Church currently has listed. I've talked with a couple of real estate brokers just about what would that listing look like. And they said from a business that's looking for highway frontage, um, they're not looking for 10 acres, let alone the transitional zoning challenge that was brought up. Um, but they said 27 acres collectively, that's going to get some attention. Um, and so from just a, you know, if the understanding amongst all three parties is that there's a, a different use intended for this property, and there's some agreement, we'll have to work out, you know, details, obviously, we've got three groups. Um, but if there's a general understanding that we need to all move on from this property and capture what value each of the entities can from it, then there probably needs to be some additional discussions about how to go about doing that. Um, listing agreements, brokers, all those questions come to mind on what is that path to, to achieve some mutually beneficial um, uh, <laughs> um, arrangements for each of these entities. Um, Real quickly also, I, I think the comment was made about, um, um, and I wasn't here for, for all that discussion, but the, the cost of utility extensions, I think I noted in the staff report, there are some utility um, extensions that would be needed to develop this property, as well as stormwater considerations for drainage um, and um, road widening or pedestrian um, movement improvements. So that we certainly understand that the concept of believe this reference is development pays its own way. And typically to do that, if there's three, just going back to kind of history, if there were three parties involved in a property, typically there'd be a development agreement that outlines who is responsible for what part or what cost or how that sharing was worked out. Again, I wasn't here for that conversation, but that sounds like maybe the hurdle that they ran into in the past was how do we extend those utilities and make that happen cost effectively to allow that development to proceed especially if it was happening during the time of a recession. I'm, I'm certain that conversation couldn't have ended well. <laughs> um, but so that with that context, um, I think knowing that those, there are some improvements needed to develop the site, um, finding the right you know, buyer um, would be interested in making those improvements, improve the site, um, and hopefully capture some value for all of our community partners to move their next step of plans forward. Eddie, I have a question for you. Whose responsibility is it to develop the land? Oh. Whose responsibility is it to develop the land they purchase? Is that on the town side or is that on the developer side? So the, the concept you, and it's, I'll use air quotes here, but the, typically you hear development pays its own way. Got it. The, the, the entity who's desiring the development of the site would pay for the improvements needed to support that um, construction, that development. In this case, there were three parties involved, um, all of which may have been experiencing different challenges with financing. Um, so I think that, you know, anytime you have multiple parties involved, you'd need to clearly indicate who would be responsible for what. Got it. What is the proposed land use for in our comp plan for this acreage? The, uh, the future land use map of the comprehensive plan identifies this area as commercial. C1, C2, C3. Commercial. Just. Future land use map is a broad brush stroke. Got it. just identifies the area as commercial. Okay. So is there a way that we could even look at saying, no, we're not going to allow C3, or is it, we're not going to allow liquor stores. Are we allowed to not allow that? Who knows that? Yeah. I believe the, the school in such pro proximity would make that impossible. Well, 27 acres, the setbacks, is there a possibility on setbacks that they could place something there on the far end of a development? I would suggest that, I, I, th I think I understand the intent of the comment that there's certainly some sensitivity regarding the site, the desires of the current owners and proximity to school and community facilities. Um, I think we can acknowledge that that's a, a concern and a consideration that needs to be figured out, but we wouldn't necessarily have to identify the means and methods tonight. 
Uh, it definitely seems that sitting empty, it's serving no one at this point. I think that's safe to say from everybody who's involved. So I appreciate you guys sharing this information. Um, my question is, and this doesn't have to be right now, but if we can get some of the results of the hearing associated with the previous zoning request change that did fail, so we could see maybe the reasons why that occurred or whatever. I think that's pertinent just information that would be good for background information. I remember this vaguely, but this- Okay, I, um, I'm, I mean, we might be able to, I don't know if we, we could just get it, the documentation of it to see the exact exact hearing items and the- yeah, I'm happy to provide some follow-ups and I, I see everyone yeah. moving the clock. I'm I just worried we, about- We do have another meeting that starts at 6.30, which is why everyone's kind of watching the clock, but <clears throat> I would think that um, at a high level, we could address a couple of those topics. I mean, there, when we go through a rezoning application, um, the town, Planning Commission makes a recommendation and the Board of Trustees makes a final determination. There's a, a list of factors that are evaluated, considerations or findings of fact that are that are considered in forming the recommendation and then making the decision. Um, at the time, the rezone was heard for Wellington Community Church to rezone that property from transitional to C3 highway commercial. Um, the, the overriding factors from the Board of Trustees at that time was that it should be some form of commercial use. Um, but the, the biggest concern for not approving it was, and so I, and I think there was large support to change to commercial, the, but the overriding factor was that not all three entities were on the same page at that time in terms of what that future looked like. And that the concern was that approving a portion of it for commercial use and not the rest of it would allow one, fragment of that property to develop in one way that wasn't a unified development plan with the rest of it. And eventually as you development, as development occurs piecemeal, someone gets left with the bag. Someone has to finish everything that wasn't done by the prior developments and cost considerations get tricky in that scenario. And so the, the overarching theme that was the basis from the board of trustees recommendation to not approve the zoning at that time was based on, we wanna make sure this is a cohesive, planned, well thought out development and development developing piecemeal was not going to get there. And I wanna absolutely offer, Russ, if you wanna to add to that. You're putting the best light and I'll go with it. <laughs> I, I, I wanna be fair. <laughs> if there's anything you wanna add, I don't wanna take away from no, that opportunity. It's, it's, I mean, there's more to be said, but that's, that's fair. And we don't need to retread old stuff. I mean, that's, that's more of us. That's more. <laughs> And I think something that, that I, I will speak for us, uh, for Pastor Russ, excuse me, um, that uh, the, the church has moved forward with other plans. And I, this is in your bullet points, um, but they have acquired the property by Rice Elementary down on Fifth Street. They've also gone through the town's entitlement process to get site plans approved for that. Those plans are approved, accepted, ready to go. Um, so the church has, has obviously moved on and the Boys and Girls Club too in, in redeveloping the gymnasium and other sites um, that were previously owned by Wellington Community Church. So I think someone else had said it well earlier, all, all three of these entities are kind of waiting for what's the next step. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but this would definitely help you with the Rice property so you can expand your church and move forward, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I mean, based on the coordination and the everything I've heard tonight, I would love to learn more about how this could proceed. And so if it were maybe a general consensus, we could maybe recommend that we start working on that how and then start working towards that. I don't know if anybody else is in agreement, but yeah. On board. Sounds like a plan. Russ, I just want to make sure if- Microphone, please. If they can't guarantee that it won't be something that could, that would not possibly house um, the kind of stuff you requested, is it something you're still wanting to move forward with? Well, I only speak for the church in the sense that I'm in the meeting right now. Uh, any of these kind of decisions would have to go back to the church for a final vote. Got it. So um, there is that, re that recognition that if we could front load that discussion where these things won't happen, that vote, that vote I'm sure will go very fast. Awesome. So I think maybe that might be the next conversation, if it's possible. Yes. 
Absolutely. So I think a lot of that comes into when we're selling the property, right? You can choose who you sell it to or not. So if someone comes in and says, we're going to build a, you know, an adult entertainment and a bar, obviously the church would not be okay with selling to that party. Um, if someone comes in and says, hey, we're going to, you know, build a dry cleaner in this or a, a grocery store, great. And they do that. You know, if 30 years down the road, someone redevelops that at that point, I don't think the church is concerned about 30 years from now, someone comes and build something else. But I think it's more so we're not going to sell the property now to someone who's going to build something they would disagree with. And that we can choose who to sell or not to sell. There's no zoning or anything like that required. We just say, they say, this is what we're building. The church says, we're not comfortable with this. And we have an agreement that we don't move forward with that. Got it. Now, if they go to the planning commission, can they request being like a C1 or is that out of their hands at that point? Is it the planning commission that puts that on or what? So good question. Um, but just keep in mind with three owners, there needs to be some agreement amongst right. the parties so that we make sure that everyone's needs are satisfied. Mm -hmm. um, and at, at this point, as, if all three parties are working cooperatively to move a process forward, the, the board of trustees can actually initiate a rezone. We wouldn't have to put either of the, the Boys and Girls Club or the church in a position where they're asking to reapply for a zone change. We can initiate that on, as the town. So if you guys have the meeting of the minds, we could do it immediately whenever we decide on doing it, correct? We, we could definitely move it forward. I mean, there are some considerations that need to be worked out in terms of you know reaching those mutually understood agreements and things like right. that as joint sure. owners of property. Um, but certainly, um, we'd be able to move something forward right. to to rezone the property to a, to a zone district that is compatible and suitable for all three parties. Perfect. Okay, I awesome. think we I think we received the information we needed tonight. We needed yeah. to make sure there was consensus, and then we can start talking about what that process <laughs> looks like moving forward. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And um, thank you, thanks everyone for your time. Thank this you. was perfect. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, thank you guys. Ashley, come with me. It's Mayor? No. no. Excuse that. <laughs> huh? Got it. Yeah, oops. Okay. Come and present.
your way. Yeah. 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 Okay. Huh? <laughs> Did you bring my cigar? I know, right? Oh, we could. Yeah. Okay. So I hope this starts going. You know, they could make that into a nice commercial area out there. Right. Like I said, one of these days I'm going to learn how to use these computers. Yeah, it, it looked like it. But you know, if you take out C3, I mean, All right. most of the people. You guys ready? You guys ready? Oh, yeah. Trust you, you guys ready? Yes. For C1 or C2. Call to order the May 24th regular meeting of the Wellington Board of Trustees, the time being 6.32. Please all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Call. May I get a roll call, please? Trustee Gator. Here. Trustee Kenny. Present. Trustee Mason. Here. Trustee Eats. Present. Trustee Wiegand. Here. Mayor Pro Tem McDonald. Mayor Shosi. Here. Are there any amendments to the agenda this evening? No. Okay. Are there any conflicts of interest related to the items on the agenda this evening? No conflict of interest. I don't know if this is the time. I did want to um, express some ex parte communication in result um, in regards to item number three and four. Um, I believe the entire board of trustees received a couple of emails from citizens. So, yeah, and there will be opportunity at the beginning of that hearing to discuss. Okay. Ex -parte Other than that, no. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Gator. All right, we will move on to item B1, public comment. Individuals wishing to speak on non-agenda items are asked to sign up on the form provided at the podium. Once called upon, please come to the podium, state your name, and you will be limited to three minutes during this comment. Good evening, board, mayor and trustees. Melissa Whitehouse, 3922 Grant Avenue. I apologize for the fact that I did not attend the May 10th meeting that discussed the $25,000 grant. It was very, very disappointing to hear that four of the trustees voted that grant acceptance down. I'm not sure that the trustees expressed facts for the reasons why they voted down that particular grant. It sounded like it was purely opinion. There was one fact that I had heard about was that it would cost $2,500 on the part of the town to accept that $25,000 grant. Now, I don't believe that the four trustees engaged in that no vote understand the domino effect of turning down a grant that's awarded, any grant that's awarded. Town staff has never in the past, and, I, and when I say never, when I started attending meetings in 2015, there was really only one tool at the disposal of the Board of Trustees to do anything for the town. And that one tool was to cut costs. We had exponential growth in residential um, building and construction in 16 and 17. Town staff could barely keep their heads above water. So they certainly couldn't go out and search for grants. So again, the only tool in the toolbox was cut costs, cut, 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 cut. 
And what happened to infrastructure because of that? It started failing. Now, what we have at our disposal right now, and our extraordinarily town staff has been working hard, most of it on their own time, to diligently search for every possible grant in the country at any level, county, state, national, and they've been successful. It's been pretty amazing that they've been successful. And in this one instance for a $25,000 grant, the choice was made to turn that grant down. $25,000 grant and the word is already out. Yesterday I attended the Water Literate Leaders um, graduation, which is a group of elected officials from local towns and surrounding cities. They're already talking about this. They are the competition. They smell blood. They know that if you turn down grants, there's more grants to come that might not be awarded to us. Safe routes to school, infrastructure for Main Street, infrastructure for bridges. Please reconsider, bring this discussion up, table it if you have to, but at least bring it up and have that discussion, hopefully with Trustee McDonald in attendance. Thank you. Uh, Blair Peterson, 11703 North County Road 7, Wellington. Also, I work at the Wellington Grill here in town. I apologize for cutting Melissa's time short. I thought I had to be called. I didn't know I could just speak. I'm here this evening to discuss the Water Now Alliance grant that Melissa just referenced that was dismissed at a previous board meeting. I find it illogical and irresponsible that this board would turn down free money that was asked for by the previous board. That grant request was written using upwards of 30 staff hours and was designed to benefit this town, our town. It is not influenced by the coalition that is funding it. It is 100% Wellington. Board of Trustees and town staff not only wrote it to benefit the town, but will also be responsible for implementing the communications package that will come from it. If the issue in accepting it is distrust of the funding, then this current board is openly stating that they distrust themselves each other and our staff, which would be a disturbing position to take. I also find it interesting that a few of the trustees that voted against accepting this grant have gone on record saying that the number one priority for Wellington and its residents is the water issues they are facing. They have stated that all other budgets should be cut and that the town shouldn't consider new development, other infrastructure improvement, or expanded activities until water rates for residents are brought to a more manageable level. Why then are those same members turning down free money that would help the town move toward more sustainable water rates? This, coupled with the fact that one of the commissions liaised by one of the trustees who voted against this grant is going to an ask, ask for an additional almost $2,000 to be added to their budget leads me to believe that members of this board are currently more concerned with their following with following and fulfilling their own special interests with blatant disregard to what the citizens of this town actually need. The Water Now Alliance is one of the biggest partners and supporters of the Colorado Municipal League, which is the statewide body that oversees and represents all municipalities in Colorado. The Municipal League is also a resource for many other grants. So imagine what they're thinking when they see that the town of Wellington has turned down the free money that they applied for. Obviously, we either do not need grant funding or we're too stupid to take it. But either way, we'll be last in line for the next grant that comes up. I personally do not live my life concerned with how others view me, but when you are a part of a governing body, you must be a little more aware of the represent, reputation you are garnering amongst those similar to you. Similarly, or seriously, ask yourselves, what municipality turns down free money, especially a municipality that is currently facing a water crisis and was awarded free money to help them better communicate with residents about ways to fight that water crisis. 
Additionally, the communications package developed by the grant would be of use to the entire town for the foreseeable future. The lack of voter turnout and the participation in these meetings alone should tell you that the town and the board need to come up with a better communication style to reach the members of this, communi this community. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll just be brief. My name is Suzanne Burtis and I live at 3234 Wild West Lane. And I just want to address the fireworks problem. Um, the, for the past few years, it's been out of control. And especially in my neighborhood, um, where people who suffer from PTSD are seriously affected by this. Veterans and people, even myself, who suffer from PTSD, uh, I can't believe how bad it's gotten. I don't know what can be done, but it's it's got something needs to be done. And uh, I just needed to voice my opinion on this. So thank you. Good evening, I'm Lowry Moyer, 3814 Harrison. I too want to address the Water Now Alliance MOU that was um, denied at the last meeting. As a grant writer, grant writing takes a great deal of time, thought and energy. And the package that you present to funders is one that you are proud of and one that you feel passionately about in the need. Without that need, there would be no package worth awarding. The funders do their due diligence and look at the, the project that was presented to them and the application in hand, and they take the time and effort to really go through every single word. Every word is important, every character of that application. And we were awarded that. Why? Because we desperately need it. During our forums, during past trustee meetings with the other board, communication and the water issues were the thing that were talked about the most. We need to communicate better. We need to do something about our water problem. This MOU presented an opportunity for our town and the people of our town to be reached in a way that they have not had the opportunity to be communicated to in a very long time, if ever. I ask that you please reconsider you were elected as a bipartisan board to have words like equity or environmental or the backing or that it's from California be reasons to deny our citizens. The opportunity to have this is illogical to me. And I took this from their website. They are about the fair and inclusive distribution of economic political, social, and natural resources, and opportunities to improve the livelihood of individuals and the overall health of society. Why would we not want that for Wellington? Thank you. Thank you. Get that out of the way. Uh, Tim Whitehouse, 3922 Grant Avenue. I emailed you all earlier today. I just graduated from the Water Now Alliance, which is about a hundred hour class that takes place over the last year with a couple of other Patty, Mr. Patty Garcia and uh, former uh, trustee Knutson. This is like drinking from the fire hose. Um, they look at all aspects of water, the development of water, the development of water rights, the scarcity of water. And this is not getting better, right? what you see now is going to be our new normal. And so you talk about water efficiency, you talk about water conservation. I mean, it's not all hopeless. Again, I, I listed off some bullet points about the snowfall, uh, the runoff rates and Lake Mead and Lake Powell. I mean, there is a crisis. It is coming down the tracks and you can't stick your head in the ground. And if someone's offering you a way to maybe look at it and find some information. One of the things that was always talked about in this conference was the only way you solve these problems is through collaboration. This is a regional issue. Wellington's not gonna solve it. If we don't have the talent in state, go out of state. I mean, this issue is not going to go away. I mean, that is my, and for two years, I've been reading on water just as a trustee myself to understand better. We spent the last two years putting the foundations under water and wastewater to get this town back on its feet. And 
that was a heavy lift and some fairly unpleasant meetings, you know that. But, you know, one comment, someone said, we shouldn't have outside money coming into town. Well, let us not forget that the last election, money from the marijuana industry and the Republican Party of Larimer County flowed into this town. So let's call us, let's be honest with that, right? And I'll tell you, I mean, someone suggested there's money that's blue or red. It's green. This is green. I mean, you guys are smart enough to prevent some agenda from the UN being rammed down our throats. Come on. Do you really think, I don't think you're gonna let that happen. You know, just like you're not gonna allow a pig farm on Main Street, it's just not gonna happen. So I urge you strongly to reconsider this. Here's some points. I mean, I, again, spend like 10 hours a day in a class for once a month. I mean, I recommend to anybody take this class. It will open your eyes. It's a good thing, but we need to collaborate. We need to find solutions because again, the situation we find ourselves in, there's not going to be more water. There's going to be less water. And that's, that's the reality you have to address. And that's the truth. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Richard Seaworth, 4283 White Deer Lane. I'm chairman of the Box Elder Flood Authority. And I did have the pleasure of taking the mayor on a tour uh, I wanted to come and report that the project that I showed you, it's been completed and it's working really well. Uh, the problem we've had is we've got done and we had groundwater issues. And so we had to put a drain in to get rid of those. We're not complete, but we're getting close. I have some more ideas on maybe we might be able to do it. In about four years, we should be able to pay off the loan if we don't run into any more problems. At that time, town of Wellington is going to get a couple million dollars back. So you're going to need that. This was a $13 million project that turned into a $34 million project. Some horrible, horrible engineering happened. We think that we have this kind of under control. So I wanted to let the board know, and I want Tim's going to come give you, he's your representative. I represent uh, Wellington and Larimer County. So Larimer County is going to inherit, Larimer County, Fort Collins and Tinnath are going to inherit the Eastside Detention Facility, which is just south of the golf course on the interstate. We're going to inherit uh, the Clarks Lake project uh, along with Larimer County. So, and that we, we all have money in there to handle that. So I wanted to let you know if you have any questions, be glad to answer. Okay. Thank you. I've got two topics. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out about the Box Elder, uh, Richard Seaworth is now president of the Box Elder Stormwater Authority. Uh, he was voted in recently. This project that we just completed is one of the first ones that got done. Could you state your name, please? My name is Tim Singwald. I'm sorry. There's Thanks, a lot Tim. of new faces here. I, I'm sorry. Um, but under his leadership, this got done ahead of schedule and under budget and it dried up the area. I walked it about five hours ago and I didn't see standing water there. There's some wonderful deer habitat there and I ran out some whitetails and there's some good bucks in there doing rubs, but uh, Richard's done a great job for the town. Um, and we both have kind of a, an interest in making sure Wellington stays good. So it's nice to have him representing both. Um, I wanna talk about water from the standpoint of, I've heard rumors that the town has elected not to water the parks. And I've heard two reasons why we're not watering the parks. And I didn't know if that's an issue that you guys have decided to forego watering the parks. Um, my main concern is Wellington Community Park uh, the citizens worked really hard about seven, eight years ago. We had a grassroots effort. 
We had hundreds of townspeople work on that project. It had to go to a ballot issue. It passed the ballot issue with flying colors. People in Wellington like their parks and trails. I'm hearing one rumor, and I, I wanted to come to you and see what, what the truth is. But one rumor was that you don't want to water the parks in solidarity with all these homeowners who are stressing out over not having enough water. That's not an issue for the parks. The parks are using raw water. I gave you the town of Wellington a well to pump out of in order to water that park. The sprinkler systems don't seem to be working. The, the grass is getting stressed and the weeds are coming up and damage can be done to sod that's very expensive to fix. The town's people understand the difference between raw water and processed water. And um, it'd be nice to have a nice green facility for people to go to. Please rethink that. You're a new board, rethink that if that's an issue. I also heard that the, the well ran out of water, it's dry and that's a reason that's been given to people. I have four wells along the north side of Buffalo Creek. I can give you additional water. Let's water the parks. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Can I address that, please? Yes. Thank you. So it is a rumor. Um, we are watering our parks. We are following the same watering restrictions as um, our residents at the request of the Board of Trustees, but the parks are being watered. And in the future, if you want to contact me, I'd be happy to address those questions for you. We should have a conversation since we need help. Okay. Okay, thank you. No other further comments? Oh. Hello, um, I'm Jesse Andreen, and I, um, I've heard a lot of people talk about free money with this grant, and I don't think that money is ever free. Um, it's true that, or I wanted to ask if it's true that we won't be eligible for future grants if we don't accept this grant, because I don't know if that's truth or a rumor. Um, but I wondered if you guys could explain that to us, if so. And I agree that we should educate our community about water conservation, but I think that that need is something that town staff can do already. Um, and I think that if we want to conserve water and tell residents how they should use water, we should address the town's irresponsible watering first, which I'm not saying all of it is irresponsible, but you know, just like watering in the heat of the day or um, even like, do we need to turn the splash pad off? Do we need to give up hope of any future rec center swimming pool? Like, you know, just that extra water that isn't necessary necessarily. Um, and I don't understand why we would accept this grant from uh, an organization in San Francisco. Um, I guess I just, their water needs are very different than ours. So I don't know, like if it was like Arizona or something, I feel like that would be more understandable, but um, I just wondered if you guys could educate us a little more before you further try to address this topic, because I just, I don't, I was researching water now today and I didn't see what they've accomplished across the nation. I know that they're involved in Cheyenne as well, but, um, I just didn't see what they've done, what they've changed and why it would be a need for Wellington. So if, if that's possible for you guys to share more about what that looks like that would be helpful thank you thank you hi kent allen from 6863 mcclellan two things thank you for fixing the microphones so they don't <laughs> that was annoying second thing let's talk about free money i went to the water now alliance site and start doing a little bit of research on how much it costs to implement their programs. Let's try to find a town that was about the same size as Wellington. Didn't find one, but here's just a quick rundown. Aurora, population 381K. They spend 242,000 a year. They also save 2 million gallons a year. Boulder, population 107K. They spend 350K a year. Their residential 
residential, each house is saving about 5,000 gallons a year, and part of a month. Uh, Castle Rock, 76K, they spend 145K. They collect all their money from fining their town for people overusing, and they also have an uh, allotment. You only get so much water if you use more water. Shame on you, fine. And let's not become a, a water cop, please. Uh, Greeley, 149K, they spend 740K. They've reduced water in 87% of their households. Okay, how much water have they saved? 87% of their households. It's fluby dust stuff. It's moving things, you know, statistics that don't make sense. Uh, Evans, the closest one to Wellington, 21K, they don't know how much they spent on their program. They've only saved 70,000 70, gallons. Now you'll say, how much is 70,000 gallons? Well, our base rate right now per household is 7,000 gallons a month. So they save less than one household of water. So this isn't a free, free thing, guys to implement their project is gonna cost Wellington. So is it better to say no to begin with? We don't wanna do it. Or is it better to say, yeah, come on in town, tell us what to do, tell us everything we know already, but we're not gonna implement it. So yeah, your guys are stuck between a rock and a hard place, but we can't afford it, plain and simple. Thanks. I'm Rick Freeman, 7425 Viewpoint Drive. I'm not a real eloquent speaker here, but I want to know um, if it makes sense with the intelligence we have in this town, in this county, especially with Cairo State University, if we really need to take a chance on what he just presented uh, happening, or if we can't solve this among ourselves. Um, we have got a lot of people who have a lot of intelligence and we've brought it together. And I think they've done a good job of assessing what we can do in Wellington to reduce our water use. Um, I don't know that anybody from any group from California, uh, really with the way things are in California, any group really is gonna have anything positive to work for us here in Wellington. I just can't see it. Thank you. Uh, I'm Reginald Westfall. I live at 3268 Wild West Lane. I'm here about the fire issue, fireworks. And I have a bunch of signatures here on a petition I circulated. You all got a copy of that? Mr. Westfall, this is an agenda item, the fireworks. Yes. Do you I'm, want to yeah. make your comments at that time? I will. That I'm would be the appropriate time. I'm just mentioning that right now. So, yeah. Yeah, I want to say something about the water. Perfect. This, this water now thing. Perfect. Personally, I read that stuff over. I looked at all this stuff. I see a lot of people have a lot of motion and, and time secure uh, put into this. That's too bad. I feel bad about it. I put a lot of time into what I'm gonna talk about when the time comes up. Uh, and things can get pretty personal, but you have to look at the real facts and the facts are against this kind of baloney. And that's what I call it because it's just numbers and if people in this town don't know how to use water, uh, you're not gonna teach them whether they speak uh, Spanish, they speak German, et cetera. And this is only gonna be folks to certain specific little groups. And that's not gonna hit the majority of the people at all. So it makes no sense to me whatsoever. And I wasn't here the last time, it was my birthday, May 10th. You guys had a meeting on it, <laughs> but uh, uh, 
or I would have uh, voiced these uh, uh, things at the time, but it just, it doesn't make sense. They're holding out a carrot and behind that there's a big stick. Just remember that. Thank you. Okay. So with no further public comment, we'll be moving forward to the consent agenda. It consists of resolution number 20-2022, a resolution approving the town administrator's administrative plan of organization and minutes from the May 10th regular meeting. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. May I get a roll call? Trustee Gator? Yes. Trustee Kenny? Yes. Trustee Mason? Yes. Trustee Teets? Yes. Trustee Wiegand? Yes. yes. Mayor Shosi? Yes. All right, our first action item is the Jacobs contract amendment for the water treatment plant and water reclamation facility construction surface services. Mr. Meyer, Dave Meyer, engineer. Good evening, everybody. It's good to be here. Uh, I'm Dave Meyer, staff engineer. Uh, before I begin, some introdu introductions for you. I have some team members here. You all know Bob Gowing. Um, we have Nathan Ewart, my co-project manager on both of the expansion projects. David Rapier uh, behind me, he is with Jacobs. He will be the resident um, project representative that we'll be talk talking about. Kyle Snyder behind me as well as the project manager for the wastewater treatment plant from Jacobs. And online we have, I believe we have Al Paquette. He is also with Jacobs, um, should we have any questions. So the item before you right now is extensions to, um, to Jacobs contracts. So what we, what we got here um, are existing contracts with Jacobs um, for the design fees and construction services are based upon an 18 month construction schedule for the water treatment plant and a 20 month construction schedule for the wastewater treatment plant. Our CMAR contractors, one represented here, John Tucker uh, from Maltz, um, and the other contractor, Hansel Phelps, went through and um, looked at the construction schedule and those got extended in the guaranteed maximum price that this board approved um, a few months ago. So for the water treatment plant, we are about nine months short. And for the wastewater plant, about 10 months short. So what to do? So town and um, Jacob staff had several meetings starting earlier this year uh, to discuss the RPR's role and schedule of services based upon you know, the construction services that the contractors came up with. To reduce the cost of those contract extensions, you know, Jake has been the town, um, have negotiated that a single RPR will be used during the initial four months, about four months of the construction project that both plants um, and, and roughly about half time, which is what David's been doing now. Both plants, as you know, are under construction. In addition to that, um, two of the town staff engineers, myself and Nathan behind me, will assist with uh, construction administration, being responsible for preparing the meeting minutes, uh, all the weekly meeting agendas, uh, meeting uh, action, light, action items and things of that nature, which uh, we have been doing. That's, uh, that's not a small task, so, but we're taking that on. One last thing, contractors uh, did base their GMP, their guaranteed maximum price on having a full-time RPR um, on board for, for these construction schedules. And that's written in the contract in the supplemental conditions. So what does an RPR do? <laughs> well, as defined in the existing contract we have with Jacobs, I put a couple excerpts in there for you guys. Um, primarily hitting the highlights here, that person is responsible for site coordination, you know, including communications with all of the team members. Changes, including minor, minor, minor variations in work, uh, coordination of issues of changes, uh, review of contractors changes. Uh, this, this is a full-time job for that person. Um, and that person needs to be on site full-time to accomplish this. The big one here, field inspection, including all those bullet items I listed there, review of work deficient and non-conforming work. Um, that's pretty critical to have that RPR there on site. 
And David has been fulfilling that role over the last few weeks already at the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, and lastly, uh, that person would be responsible for closeout services during the, um, during the startup of the plant and the guarantees and warranties that come after that. We would be funding these extensions from the contingencies that we have in, our, in both of our contracts with Moltz and uh, Hanso Phelps. And I have attached a draft of both contracts for you all to look at. Um, so we're asking for um, approval to issue these contracts with, with Jacobs in the amounts listed there. Um, Kyle and David, is there anything you'd like to add to this? Kyle Snyder from from Jacobs. I think uh, I think Dave, you've covered the covered the basics of it very well, and uh, you know we've been pleased to work with the town and and with the contractors so far, and want to extend these required services as cost effectively as we can. Yeah. So in in conclusion, one last thing. Um, you, you can kind of think of this as, you know, this this is something that is needed. Um, if uh, this does not get approved tonight, that, that need is still there, right? We still have to fulfill that need somehow. Um, this is kind of like the town coming back to Jacobs and saying, hey, Jacobs, we negotiated our construction schedule with the contractors, um, and we got a little bit long on that. Let's negotiate, let's sit down and work out an agreeable term to get this RPR on board through the duration of the project. And that's what we did. So happy to answer any questions. I think between all of us, we should be able to respond. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments from the board? I just have two. Questions. No, go ahead. Trustee Teets. So one of my questions was, is does this alter any of the Davis-Bacon wages that you guys agreed to in the contract with the ex that extension? No, it has no impact. Awesome. Um, and does this affect the on time under budget agreement that we had issued with contractors or does that also extend that out as well? You're talking about wastewater treatment plant. It, it, no, it does not affect that. Perfect. No. Um, no, this is strictly between the town and Jacobs. Okay. Um, Mr. Snyder and Mr. Rapier, welcome and thank you for joining. Um, I will say I had a meeting and was able to hear about just how much it was desired that you guys specifically were joining our town in this build. So I'm excited and I'm happy that Public Works is getting exactly what they need to do this project. Is most of the extension because of the uh, supply, uh, supply chain shortage in that? Well, and also too, is there any possibility that could it be brought quicker to fruition at this? Yeah, that's a good question. So, and I'm gonna have John Tucker here step up in a minute from Moltz. Um, the contractors look at that pretty carefully when they put together their GMP, which includes this, the construction schedule, which is, which is before us right now. Uh, so it did have an impact. Well, we did the wastewater plant. Uh, we were originally planning for about a 20 month and John and his team went through, looked at all of the deliverables, all of the um, supply chain issues, looked at how much overtime would be required to get that done within about 24 months um, and determined that it would be cheaper to extend it out over 30 months instead of that 20 months. Um, savings roughly of about at least $800,000 that we don't have to pay um, uh, overtime rates to any of the laborers. Um, so to extend that out, you know, we'll save $800,000 at least, but we have to, you know, pay Ben Jacobs a little bit more to fulfill that gap. John, is that, did that pretty much cover? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, there was another question. Extension because of the supply chain. Yeah, it had a role in the extensions to to the construct contractor schedules. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Trustee Mason. Just kidding. Uh, my only comment is it is unfortunate at this day and age that projects are running longer and costing more than expected, and I think that's you know kind of the name of the game of doing construction right now. So I appreciate that you guys are negotiating and working for the most cost-effective option. And I appreciate that you brought that to us. We pay close attention to that. Thank you. Trustee Gator. 
so thank you for answering some of the questions that staff already answered. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, one of the questions that I had, uh, I know this has been answered to the trustees, but we're doing the one RPR at the beginning of the project and they're able to get some savings on that. Is this something that we would be able to do at the end of the project as well as things are winding down to also reduce that to having one RPR to help save some additional costs on that? I, I think it's possible, um, but we're not quite planning to do that because um, like the, the response that we gave you for that question, um, as we're ramping down those projects and starting up the plant, it's pretty critical to have an RPR on each, on each plant. If we find out that's not the case, absolutely. If one person can handle that, if David can handle it or the other RPR that comes on. And then the other question that I had with that is in the, oh, um, the other question that I had was on there within that there was a $5,000 in expenses mm -hmm. outside of the time cost. What were those $5,000 for? Mm -hmm. um, we, I don't have the response in front of me right now, but primarily that was for a vehicle, right? For, for travel um, cost for, for the Jacobs people or person. Um, so I think what we worked out with Jacobs, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kyle, is um, they have leased a vehicle for the RPR's use at a very reasonable rate a month, less than $100 a month. Um, I think it's even like 60 or $70 a month, um, and plus the fuel prices. So that would cover some of those expenses. And the other expenses are typical things you see in the contract of this nature, like for shipping, for basic supplies. Um, is that about it, Kyle? There were some, a few other things that we had that we came up with. Miscellaneous inspection equipment. That there you go. Yeah. And if, you know, if we don't need that full 5,000 out of the city, okay, we won't. Be can we come to... in under the number so it can staff work with Jacobs oh, to yeah. try and keep that yeah. further down, but we're saying this is the maximum that it could go. Yeah, absolutely. That That's just the maximum number that they invoice us for expenses. No other questions. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say that you guys, I mean, working back and forth, coming to some sort of compromise to reduce the cost as much as possible and to continue trying to do so is incredible. And I just commend all of you in working hard and diligently on this to save us money every way you can. Um, so I just appreciate you, the staff, everybody involved in this. Um, so thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Are there any uh, comments from the public regarding this agenda item? No. Okay. We will bring it back to the board for any final comments. I'll start with Trustee Kinney. Um, I don't have any, and I would uh, just be behind approving this. So. Trustee Gator? Uh, really only final comment, and I was not able to do research, so I didn't bring this up, but I was a little concerned that we had this much of an extension, and I understand a lot has changed, and I understand that we need to work within the project, but I think just um, this is our sixth extension <laughs> on, with Jacobs on the water plant, so it is a little um, frustrating to already be eating into our um, our overflow that we have on this project, but um, I understand that we need to get it. So um, I would really appreciate, we work to keep that number as low as we possibly can, so. I apologize, I overheard in the audience, someone was asking what an RPR was. Could you describe that really quick? So I realize we acronym use acronyms. Resident Project Representative. Got it. Yes. No other questions. Appreciate everything you've done. I think you're doing a fantastic job. I know a project this size is incredible. And uh, hopefully you can come under budget and quicker. So appreciate it. Yeah, I would uh, I would echo the same thing. Thank you guys for doing the best you can to keep these keep these down for us. I, I do echo the same concern that Trustee Gator has in the sense that uh, you know. Uh, ho hopefully we don't see any more or, or many more extensions to this deal, but uh, let's get it done. Perfect. Yeah, I'm right in line with everybody here. I think we just need to get it done. Um, obviously, you guys are working hard to keep the prices down, so appreciate that. 
Hearing no further comments, I would like to seek a motion. I move to approve the execution of contract amendments with Jacobs Engineering Group in the not to exceed amount of $210,280 and $238,880 for the water treatment plant and water reclamation facility respectively. For extended services during construction, including the resident project representative with monies being funded from the owner contingencies contained within the guaranteed maximum price of each project. I second. May I get a roll call? Trustee Kenny? Yes. Trustee Mason? Yes. Trustee Teets? Yes. Yes. Trustee Gator? Yes. Mayor Shosi? Yes. All right, moving on, we have a contract for materials testing and inspection for the water reclamation facility expansion project. Mr. Meyer. Yes, thank you, Dave Meyer, staff engineer. Um, this is for materials testing. Uh, materials tests are required at both plants, the water treatment plant and the wastewater treatment plant. The one in front of you is for the wastewater treatment plant. <clears throat> um, so CTL, the, the uh, firm that we want to use for the testing, has prepared the geotechnical report uh, a few years ago for the plant. Um, and when possible, it's a good idea and prefer to have that same firm, if they have the capability, uh, to perform the materials testing and inspections during their construction. Uh, CTL is well-versed in this. They We used them before. Uh, they have done a good job for us, and they're ready and willing to fulfill these services for us. CTL provided their fees with respect to the required tests that were called out in the specifications by Jacobs in the design. Um, they also responded to um, quantity takeoffs from the guaranteed maximum price that the contractor put together to estimate the amount of testing that would be required. And those tests would include such things as soil compaction test, um, asphalt testing, Big one, concrete testing, masonry observations, structural steel inspections, and et cetera. These are the things that CTL will be doing. Typically, in projects like this, the contractor calls for the tester to come on site, although sometimes, David, um, the RPR person would, would call as well. <clears throat> the funds uh, to pay for the CTL fees have been accounted for in the approved 2022 budget. So we are asking for approval of contract with CTL for $123,902. Any questions, we're happy to answer. Oh, and I did attach the draft contracts too. Any comments or questions from the board? We'll start with Trustee Wiegand. No problem. Trustee Mason. Trustee Kenny. I just want to acknowledge that these are expected costs that were already included within the budget that was approved for 2022. Thank you. Sure. Trustee Gator. Yeah, could you just, what was the budgeted amount for the GL this was for? The, you mean the uh, budget amount, Trustee Gator? Yes, the, uh, you, said, you guys put on there the line item that we pre-budgeted yeah. for, what was that? 125,000. Uh, perfect, thank yeah. you. Trustee Teets. No, nope, I'm excited to approve this. This is extremely important. And going step by step, I've worked with boring companies before, so I know how important this is for not only now, but moving forward in the future. Perfect. I don't have any comments. I think it's we got to get it done, budgeted. Are there any public comments on this agenda item? We will bring it back to the board for any final comments. None. Hearing no further comments, I would like to seek a motion. Or, yeah. Move to approve execution of contract with CTL Thomas in the not to exceed amount of $123,902 for materials testing inspections during construction of the water reclamation facility with monies being funded from the project's budget. I second. <laughs> Roll call. Trustee Mason? Yes. Trustee Teets? Yes. Trustee Wiegand? Yes. Trustee Gator? 
Yes. Trustee Kenny. Yes. Mayor Shosi. Yes. Yes. All right. Next is the public hearing to consider and consider annexation of the lamb annexation property into the town. Before Mr. Burr presents, are there any conflicts of interest on this agenda item? Okay, is this where I talk, Dan, about ex parte communication, or is that later? It's the next item after conflicts of interest. So I think um, oh. if you look at the list that Cody provided in the list, it's conflicts of interest, then disclosure of ex parte communications. So, okay. Um, does, oh yeah, does the board need to disclose any ex parte communications? <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I know the board members received um, an email, or two I think today, I haven't read the second one, um, but did receive an email from a resident earlier today in regards to the, the property and their desires to see with the annexation. And then there was a second email I have not had the opportunity to read in, but also did come into the Board of Trustees. Um, I also had a resident ask me about this when I was at the fishing um, thing on Saturday. I told them I was not going to be able to speak about that. So that was as far as that conversation went. But other than that, no further conversation. I have also read the, the email that came in today. I've received an additional, additional email asking to not approve a zoning um, and only approve an annexation. I also looked at the comprehensive plan when I was working through all of these documents and also looked up some things to understand what library districts and how that involved an annexation. I received the email. Okay. Mr. Burke, you may have the floor. Thank you, Mayor Shosi. Uh, Cody Bird, Planning Director for the town. Um, I want to take a quick moment to point out that you have the next two agenda items are related to the same topic. The first item is the public hearing. Public hearing. Um, you'll receive a staff introduction and explanation of regarding the request, um, as well as information contained in your packet. Um, we'll have uh, there's a representative uh, representing the applicant who's here tonight as well, who will have an opportunity to share some comments, um, and then. Um, we'll have public testimony. You'll hear from anyone from the public that wants to speak on the on the item. Um, following the public comment portion of that, the applicant will have an opportunity to respond to any of those comments. Staff will also have an opportunity to respond, uh, kind of closing comments. Um, and then at the end of that, um, the board would close the public hearing. The second item or item number four on your agenda is consideration of an ordinance. Um, that is relative to um, this particular request. So two parts. The first was the public hearing. Any questions on the process and the steps that we'll go through? Cody, I have a question for you very quick. Is this only approving an annexation or is it approving annexation and zoning? That's my very next point. So great, Sorry. great lead in. No, <laughs> you're just fine. Thank you, Trustee Dietz. Um, so that being the explanation on the process that we're going to go through. My next point, um, a couple of um, quick components here. Um, the consideration of annexation is also two parts. Um, there's the determination of whether it's appropriate to include the property in the town limits of the town of Wellington, actual annexation, bringing it into the town. The second part that you will consider is zoning for the property. When a property is brought into the town from the unincorporated Larimer County, the county zoning designation no longer has jurisdiction for properties in the town. So the properties brought into the town, it's appropriate to assign a zoning district for that property when it's brought in. So the process is annexation. If it's approved, the town would then assign an appropriate zoning district for that property in accordance with the town zoning regulations. Um, so that's, those are the two considerations that you'll be doing tonight. And appreciate you sticking with me. I wanted to explain that so that the public could hear it as well. Um, a couple more quick uh, kind of caveats or, or notations on this particular application. Um, wanted to note that there was a change of ownership in this particular property. The uh, Linda Lamb was identified as the applicant. Uh, Ms. Lamb did submit the original petition for, um, for annexation to the town. Subsequent to the town board starting the process of annexation, the contract purchaser went ahead and closed on the property. 
um, taking over the ownership. Um, Ms. Julia DeVries, representing DeVries Properties LLC, um, did attend the planning commission meeting and introduced herself as the owner of the property and in, uh, intent to continue to pursue the annexation process. Um, and then if that's my high level. There was, we're acknowledging there was a change of ownership that doesn't invalidate the application. The process was started and it can continue. The consideration is whether or not it's appropriate to annex the property into the town. Um, and then um, Mr. Tom Donnelly representing the applicant. If, if there's anything you wanna share on that um, in a moment, then you'll have an opportunity to as well. My last background notation I wanna make, <laughs> this, uh, this property, the lamb annexation was previously considered for annexation in the town in 2020. Um, went through all the same proceedings, the same process, same applicant and owner at that time. Um, Mrs. Lamb, the owner, uh, the previous owner now. Um, and that annexation process at the end of that process was approved. Uh, it was approved in the condition that it had to be recorded and made legally official uh, within 180 days um, of the approval. And for whatever reason, um, we did not get the signed executed documents back from the property owner. Therefore, we didn't have the documents to record and we couldn't make it a legal process binding saying that, yep, it's all done, everything is recorded and, and the clerk and recorder's office, the county assessor, all those other agencies saying, yep, check the box, it's done and complete. Didn't happen. So the effect of that was that that prior annexation proceeding became null and void under the terms of the ordinance that was adopted. So this is a, a do-over of sorts. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that for anyone who's here that feels like this is deja vu, um, we are in fact doing it a second time following the same procedures. So first part, <laughs> thanks for sticking with me on the background. The first part of the, of the consideration for an annexation is determining the appropriateness of whether the property should be annexed in the town. Um, for reference, there's a location map in your, in your agenda packet. Um, the property in question is about 0.57 acres in size. It's located on the east side of 6th Street, directly south of the hotel. Um, it's near the in, uh, inter intersection of 6th Street and Sveta. So determining the, the appropriateness, um, it's worth noting that this property is actually completely surrounded by the town. Um, the town has annexed properties on all sides of this, leaving this property what's referred to as an enclave, uh, which is a property that's unincorporated Larimer County in the middle of the town. It's also within the town's three mile um, plan that's required for considering annexations in the town. So that legal box is checked. Um, it is within our three mile plan. It's also within the town's growth management area, our GMA. Um, and the planning commission and its recommendation evaluated those components as well as the availability of municipal services to the site. There's an annexation impact report that's a required element of an annexation case that's included in your agenda packet. It identifies how the town would provide municipal services to the site. There are utilities in 6th Street for water and sewer. The site's not currently served by water and sewer, but it's easy to extend those as part of a development plan. There's adequate roads. We provide other services, um, LCSO, the Sheriff's Office through our contract, um, town planning, zoning, building services, um, public works, water utilities, all of those, the whole host of, of town municipal services are available to serve the site and we can serve that within our existing resources. Um, also want to reference in your agenda packet, there are uh, a multitude of attachments. Um, one of them is the annexation map. That's the official, once completely executed, it would be recorded. That's the legal document saying this piece of property is annexed into town and here's what it looks like. There's also a master plan. They look the same because there's, it's such a small property. The boundaries are the same. So it's pretty easy to understand that. Um, and then there's also uh, a one page kind of narrative that the applicant submitted explaining their request, um, which I'll let them speak to more of that uh, here in just a moment. Um, and then there's a concept site plan. I want to acknowledge that that is it's concept only. Um, during the previous considerations, one of the comments that was, was made or questioned was whether or not the size of that property would even support development. And so what the applicant has done is gone ahead and provided a concept site plan to show the, the type of a building, parking lots, required parking access. So it's, it's just a concept to show that it is in fact a developable piece of property. And staff has taken a look at that and we agree um, it could be done. It's you know a small site, but it's functional so that we can, they can make it work. Um, that concept site plan is not part of the approval process. It was just to demonstrate that it could be done. 
Um, so Planning Commission heard this application for annexation um, at the May 2nd Planning Commission meeting. And following those considerations, the Planning Commission did uh, unanimously vote to recommend approval of annexing the property into the town of Wellington. The second component <clears throat> is the zoning considerations. The, <clears throat> excuse me, for the zoning considerations, the applicant has requested C3, um, it's mixed use commercial zoning, it's formerly known as highway commercial zoning. So the applicant requested C3, um, going through the planning commission recommendation process, uh, staff provided the staff report also included in your packet I've also included a zoning map showing the existing zoning surrounding the property and a table of the zoning uses that's currently in our uh, town zoning code. Following the planning commission's recommendations based on the findings of fact in that staff report, the planning commission again voted unanimously to recommend C3 mixed use commercial zoning for this property, primarily based on, and the findings are in the staff report, but the, the primary finding was that it's located east of 6th Street where all the other properties on that side are also already zoned C3 and west of 6th Street properties are zoned C1. And it's different because it's stepping down from highway commercial use down to neighborhoods and residential. <clears throat> so again, that's based on those findings um, as part of the board's considerations. Uh, again, you've got the two parts. You'll consider whether it's appropriate to bring the property into the town and then you'll have consideration of what's the appropriate zoning district to assign that once it's under the town's zoning jurisdiction. Um, again, this public hearing process. So at this time, I wanted to extend an invitation to uh, Mr. Tom Donnelly uh, representing the applicant uh, to share any additional thoughts that he has at this time. Thank you, Cody. And it's tough to follow Cody because he does such a thorough job, but I'll, uh... I'll try to repeat everything he said and keep you here longer. Um, thanks. Uh, I'm Tom Donnelly. I'm here uh, on behalf of the applicant, DeVries Properties, LLC. I spent over a decade with uh, Trustee Gator's father on the Board of County Commissioners, and uh, we did the people's business far too often in empty rooms. And so it's amazing. Uh, I know maybe there are some people here actually opposed to this um, application, but it is wonderful to see you out here. I really appreciate that. I like seeing you here. Um, and so... Uh, you're in for a long night. God bless you all. Um, uh, so we're here for one of the most fundamental of uh, reasons, and that is um, uh, the private property rights enshrined in the Constitution and the Fifth Amendment, right? And and those are those are held in high regard by all of us in this room. I know that people opposed to this proposal and people in support of this proposal, um, government has the rightful ability to set reasonable regulation on. Uh, those private pro on those private properties and what may be done um, on on their sites. Um, so I'm here today. Uh, I think maybe I would just go over uh, the timeline a little bit. I did. I am privy to the to the um, at least one of the emails that you received about the convoluted timeline and the ownership of the property. So if if, if I may, Mr. Mayor, maybe I'd shed a little light on that for folks who may not um, understand really what happened. Um, uh, Mrs. Lamb, uh, wonderful lady. She's such a great lady. I actually gave her a Christmas present this year because I really like her. Um, but Mrs. Lamb had told, had informed us when we first um, entered into the contract for this property that was annexed. She, she, she really believed it was annexed. Um, so we had actually come to, to Cody to, lo to look at the zoning and Cody said, well, actually in our, in our rules, it says that if you don't complete the annexation documents in 180 days, then the annexation is null and void. Well, it had been over a year. And so she was well outside of the timeline. And so uh, she, they, the, your legal staff uh, took a look on, at that and said, well, there's really, there's, I mean, principally to follow both the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, we have to redo this, right? And so um, that's why we all ended up here today. Um, Mrs. Lamb, to her credit, did not, she did not willfully um, mislead us or in any way. She's a 75-year-old widow. She's a wonderful lady, as I said. And, and so um, in the midst of trying to sell this property to us, um, she just had miscommunicated um, her true understanding of, of, of the situation as it existed. Um, Mrs. Lamb, as I mentioned, she's she's fairly elderly. She's in great shape, but she's 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 older. Um, she is a widow. She had her own needs for that money, and so um, in in a typical situation, we would have we would have delayed closing um, and made it contingent on completing this this annexation and this zoning. 
Um, she didn't feel like she could do that. And so our my my client, our our owners, the Debris properties and Mrs. Debris um, uh, felt uh, that it was it was fine to go forward and place her trust in, in this body to to make a, a good and reasonable decision. Um, Mrs. Debris, as Cody mentioned, um, is a Larimer County businesswoman. She lives here with us in this county. Um, she is a, uh, it's a woman um, female owned business. Um, her primary business is farming. She is a owner of a large dairy farm um, in South Larimer County in, in Johnstown. Um, they milk about 2,500 cows down there. They farm thousands of acres of land. They have many other business interests as well. Um, as I mentioned at the planning commission meeting, um, folks who work the land, folks who make their living um, in that way are, are, are typically among the most honest and honorable people you will ever meet. Their word is their bond. Um, they will keep their word. And, and these owners are no different. I wouldn't be here working for them if they were different. And so um, uh, anything that may have to occur because of this change in ownership, we're happy to accommodate whatever the town's wishes might be. If they need us to sign any type of agreement, we've already talked about um, some of the easements that she has signed and dedicated um, that we might redo those for instance, and that's, that's no problem. So um, we, we fully accommodated Mrs. Lamb and now we're, we're here to, uh, to work with this town board. Um, I mentioned Mrs. DeVries. She couldn't be here today. She's actually um, a grandmother with 13 grandchildren. Yeah. And it's graduation time. And so she's, she couldn't be with us today. She's out visiting some grandchildren. Uh, her son, John Van Haddam is with us. Uh, John handles, he's more comfortable in the milking barn. I'm going to be honest with you. He's probably not going to talk unless you really want to hear from him. He's kind of a yep and shucks guy, but um, uh, Mr. Van Haddam is here to represent his mother and the, and the business interests of their family. And, and if you have any questions for him, we'd, he'd certainly be happy to come up here and, and talk to you about them. Um, I think I would talk maybe a little bit about what's proposed here today and, and what we're really looking at. What we're really looking at is annexation of a piece of property, as, as Cody mentioned, it's property that's entirely surrounded by the town of Wellington. So annexation, I think, is, is probably a foregone conclusion. It would, had, had this proposal not come forward, certainly the town would have probably exercised uh, um, some type of forced annexation on the property owner at some point. Um, but uh, we're here for that annexation. And then further, we're here to seek uh, a zoning and we are seeking the C3 zoning classification. Um, let's be real clear. This is not about a, a specific use. This is not about um, a specific way that we would configure this property. And if this property is zoned and annexed, we will go through a full site plan review before this board. We'll come back to you. We'll show you our plans. We'll discuss it with you. We will accommodate the desires of your, of your town staff, your engineering staff, your planning staff, and your citizens, and try to bring the very best product we can to you. Um, what we're looking at specifically here tonight is just zoning and annexation. So there's a few points I'd like to make, and I, I wish, can, can you put the zoning map up on the screen for the folks? I don't know, they can't, the TV's not even pointing the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can, I appreciate it. Maybe you can't. Folks, well, they don't have the packet, but folks can see the map up here. The dark kind of purple color is the C3 zoning designated area. And I'm gonna walk over to the map. You won't be able to hear me. I'm gonna to point to it. It's this property right here. And then this is this little weird shape, this out, out lot is uh, this property. As you can see here, Sixth Street. So as your planning director mentioned, every single property on the east side of Sixth Street is currently zoned C3, every single one. It isn't a situation, you know, the point of zoning is to try to mit put more intensive uses here and then feather as you go away, right? To less intensive uses. So you might have industrial types of stuff, then you might have commercial stuff, then you might have townhomes and more dense housing, then you might have single family homes and estate kind of lot. And so, so your whole zoning idea is to feather the zoning out. That What that does is it keeps you from having impacts but different uses uh, not, not being compatible. Um, this isn't that situation. Every property here is zone C3. In fact, if you if you didn't zone it C3, you could potentially create this the type of 
situation that the zoning is is typically just uh, uh, levied to, to to remedy. And so um, we we really believe that the entire the rest of the entire block has this zoning. We think that this um, this property would would certainly be an outlier if it didn't have this same designation. Per your zoning code, um, the C3 zoning uh, district is useful in, this is a quote, transitioning from the highway to adjacent lower density neighborhoods. And I, I don't know if you've all been on this property. You're more than welcome to go out there. It's pretty muddy right now, but maybe in a couple of days. Um, there's probably no other property in the town of Wellington that's actually closer to the highway than this one directly. There's no off ramps. There's no you know, there's no, there's a, you know, a big swale that's south of there. There's no swale. There's no setbacks. There's no other city street. It's right on the interstate. This property of all properties um, would allow to transition from the highway to a lower density um, uses further west. Um, the, uh, the, this is C3 des, uh, zoning designation would allow the town to maintain the stated objective in your code. That's your code. That's what it says. If you don't, if it's if that's not right, change the code. Don't enforce us to a different level than, than what the code says. Um, this and and this really is not germane to your discussion tonight, but I will say this: the onus is 100 percent on the property owner to make the use work on the lot as it exists. It's not up to you, it's not up to Cody. It's not up to your town engineer. It's up to it's up to Mrs. DeBreeze to find a way um, to make this use compatible on this lot. And so um, we fully intend to do that. We have put a, um, like Cody said, we put a little site plan in there just to show you that it's possible to develop a lot. And I think that's what you all want. Um, and and certainly, um, as, as I've heard, I've come to a number of these town board meetings. I think I was at your first meeting, Mayor, so you know, kind of your groupie, I guess. And, um, and so, <laughs> and so uh, you know, I know there's road issues there. We fully understand that we're going to have to address some of those issues and some of the traffic flow issues on the site. Um, I've, we've, we don't have any kind of formalized agreement, and maybe I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but, I, but I'll just tell you this. I'll give you a little inside baseball. We don't have any kind of formalized agreement with the hotel owner to the north of us, but we have met him. We've met him on his site and walked that site with him. I've talked to Cody about maybe trying to be creative, find some ways to um, have some shared access points or something like that. Again, we don't have a formalized agreement. I can't guarantee you we can do that, but we're, but we're certainly being cognizant of the idea that there's traffic issues on that road section, and we try to mitigate those um, those uh, that situation to the very best of our ability. We will we will certainly try um, as, uh, to to the extent that we can. Um, so, I look forward to hearing the public comment and getting to come back and talk about um, to what we hear. And so, uh, I will be brief, uh, and that that would conclude my comments, Mr. Mayor. If anyone, unless anyone has any questions. That's the most brief I've ever been. What are you guys talking about? <laughs> I came to the planning commission. They said I had three minutes to talk. I said I can't even introduce myself in three minutes, typically. Questions from the trustees for staff? Trustee Wiegand. Trustee Mason. Trustee Kenny. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Trustee Gates. The one question I did have was about the prior annexation and you and Mr. Bird both addressed that. So I, I appreciate that. So yep. no other questions. Thank you. Look, look forward Trust to seeing you again. Oh. Trust you, Teet. I'm sorry. Now I'm the one that has questions. Let's hear. Um, so well, kind of, I think the, the start of my questions might actually be for Cody. Um, I'd noticed in the annexation maps on page 53 of 162, uh, number two under A says the annexation map shows the present streets in the vicinity of the proposed annexation. Sixth Street adjacent to the subject property is already annexed into the town of Wellington. Sixth Street is paved roadway and future widening of the street adjacent to the subject property will be considered as part of the town road maintenance or future capital project of all the present streets in the vicinity of the subject property are shown in the annexation map and the master plan. But I'm confused because I think we've actually established twice that developers are responsible for financing a 
improvements necessi necessitated by their, their actual site. Thanks, Trustee Teets. Um, and thanks for calling out the page number. So typically what we look at in the annexation impact report, which is what you were citing from, it's a description of, that's the bottom paragraph is where uh, Trustee Teets was reading. Um, it's, a, it's a description of how the town is providing municipal services to the property owners. So absent a development request, um, the town would be responsible for that maintenance. We are responsible for the maintenance portion of that, which is the, the municipal services the town provides. Um, at the time this annexation impact report was originally prepared, there was no development proposal in hand. Um, the, for the 2020, the 2020 report is what that language came from. Um, with the new application um, or potential future application for a development proposal, those factors could be considered and we would evaluate what the cost sharing is. Um, it's possible that not every element of that road improvement would be the responsibility of the development. Um, there are, there's a, a concept in, in land use and development that's called a rational nexus and a rough proportionality. So the road improvements have to be tied, if, if it's being required by a developer, it has to be tied to their proposed development plan. So in all likelihood, this project would include elements of both the developer and the town. In particular, they would, would be looking at what happens with transitions and tapers that's not adjacent to their property. How far is the extent of what the development is responsible for providing and where does the town's responsibility take over? Can I, can I make a comment about that, Trustee? Thank you, ma'am. That's a good question. Um, we we firmly believe growth should pay for its for itself. Growth should pay its own way here in this community. We don't we don't expect to be subsidized. We, hey, we're not we're not the grant we're not offering the grant right. We're we're not eating the soup as my dad used to say. Um, and so uh, we we fully understand that 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 growth needs to pay its own way, and, and we're prepared to to step up and provide a good product um, to the town. We plan to work with your with your staff to, to try to find the very, the very best solution we can. Okay, awesome. I just, and just making sure that we're understanding that, um, cause it states here that widening improvements adjacent to the site are anticipated in the future and will be financed by the town. So I just wanna make sure that moving forward that we are guaranteeing that development is going to pay its own way. And the understanding entering into this is that we're, it's, there's nothing against partnering, but I just wanna make sure that it's done successfully. So there is minimal impact to residents. You can mark my words that we plan to be good, good business partners in this community. This is going to, I mean, I've listened to the last several meetings and kind of in, in interest, um, you know, as a, as kind of a local government geek myself and a guy who's kind of been in a similar situation to, to y'all in a, in, you know, time to time. And thank God Richard didn't mention me with the Box Elder Stormwater Authority. <laughs> oh my God, I was about to run out of here. Um, but but I have been in your I have been in your shoes. I have been in a in a revenue constrained environment. Um, I, I do know those hard choices that you sometimes are forced to make. And I and I can promise you, not only do we plan to come in here and 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 do a good quality site, we plan to be um, a tax generator for this community. We're going to grow your revenue and you're not going to need to build one new rooftop, add one more resident potentially to do it. Right. And so, because those co that residents cost you money in the long run, we're, we're going to be the opposite side of that equation. And we look forward to doing that and doing business here in Wellington. Awesome. Um, so, and just to clarify that in number two on page 61 of 162, um, I just want to make aware that there is a residence uh, 90 feet away from this property. It states that there is no residential uses. So I just wanna make sure that it's noted that we have townhomes, a large section of them, yeah, about zoning. 350 feet away is the townhomes and 90 foot away is a residential structure that has not gone through the, it's the one transitional purple piece that you're looking at there. Um, so I just wanna verify that the understanding is that there is a residential home there. 
there's a home here. You can no, nope. on the purple up right there. So that is 90 feet away from the property. Yes, ma'am. I uh, thank you uh, for your question, trustee. Um, yeah, what my my point in the in the um, in my written response to you uh, was related to zoning, right? Because what we're looking at, we're not looking at use. We're looking at zoning on this particular application. So, so when I say um, I, I'm what I'm referring to is a C. What is it called? You guys call it C one, C one zoning district across the street, not not the specific use. And so, um, the point of the zoning there is that the idea is that in the future that will be redeveloped at some point. And, and that's why your town put that zoning designation on it, right? Not, not me, I didn't do that, but your town put that zoning designation on there because I know the highest and best use of that six street frontage property is not one, a single residential home, but, but rather some type of, of commercial use as, as outlined in your code in the C1 district. That, that's what I was referring to, ma'am. So um, I, if, I was, if I was unclear, my apologies, but, but I was referring to the zoning, not the actual use. Perfect. Yeah, because I think that home was built in 1916. Yes. I so, and it does actually could qualify as a historical marker. So if they choose to do that, it so remains a resident. So could I at some point? I know, right? So <laughs> perfect. I think that was the majority of my questions on that aspect of it. So I don't have any more questions. Very good. I'll see you in a few minutes. Hopefully, All right, now we will open up to the public hearing and take comments from the public. No public. There we go. Hello, <clears throat> I'm Angelique McDaniel. 3916 Lincoln Court. And uh, I would like to share some concerns that I have referenced the annexation and zoning of the land property on 6th Street. Uh, being that there are few businesses allowed in C3 zoning that are not also allowed in C1 zoning, and that this particular property's characteristics do not lend well to some businesses, it stands to reason that the owner's designs are very possibly to establish a marijuana dispensary. I'm sure that we all can see for ourselves when we drive on North College Avenue that there is a culture that tends to pop up around dispensaries. And I worry about the kids in my neighborhood and things that they might be exposed to. The children in Old Town Wellington ride school buses that travel along 6th Street past the subject property. PSD buses 161 students past the subject property each school day. And some of them go by twice. That's 211 opportunities per day for imp imp impressionable and immature eyes to see signage for a marijuana industry and to witness the negative parts of the marijuana culture that circulate around dispensaries. There is actually a PSD bus stop on Spetta Lane. Also, please note the close proximity of the subject to the subject property of the low income housing that is owned by the Wellington Housing Authority. 8116 Fifth Street and 3914 Roosevelt are less than half a mile down the route from I-25 to this property. Residents living in those apartments, many who are elderly or young children, already have difficult circumstances to handle and strive to overcome. There is a playground in the apartment complex on Fifth Street. And while it is not an official town park, sorry, many of these children, that is their primary play area. <clears throat> is it really right for us to put a, a business in the neighborhood of our most vulnerable residents that can potentially attract crime and transient issues, a type of business that the more affluent would not want in their own neighborhoods, just so that the town can make a profit? I'd also like to note that when I reread the letter before I came here tonight, it was only sent to homeowners. These tenants don't know anything about this meeting, okay? I understand Wellington needs a commercial tax base and I fully support bringing appropriate businesses into appropriate areas for the town. And I would ask that you consider a C1 zoning for this property's annexation if you approve the annexation. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Christine Kenny, and I'm at 3315 Saratoga Street. And first, I just want to thank you so much for your concerns and all your research beyond marvelous. Now, I have been an employee of the hotel for four years now. Okay. And about six months ago, I was talking to an officer, and he said to me, what happened at the hotel? And I said, what do you mean what happened? Well, we're not, frequent, we're not frequenting it as much. Crime has gone down. It's gotten better. The employees have gotten better. I'm not trying to boast or anything because I'm there. I'm at night audit, so I'm not there. I do night audit there, but um, in, well, not all four years, but um, so that was pretty incredible. He said that to me, you know, and I was like, well, I know the staff that works there. I know when I first started there, there was a lot of crime that I didn't realize going on, like maintenance men doing, you know, leaving with refrigerate. I don't know. There was just a lot of bad stuff going on, but it was getting a lot better. Now, I only live here five, almost five years. And like I said, four years of that has been at the hotel. And I love that hotel. And it's going up. If you put in possibly a marijuana shop with this C3, to my understanding, um, that could possibly happen, you're going to go down a bad road. I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that. Uh, you have families that are going to come there, and they're going to see it right off the highway. I don't think that they'd want to stay where there is a marijuana shop for their children, whether they smoke it or not themselves. I wish nobody did, only for those who, whatever it helps or whatever. But we all know, in all honesty, just like most medications get misused and addictions start, you know, I know people like to say, oh, you know, it's so, you know, it, it helps some people. Well, it's a, little, it's a minority there, but the majority of it is, let's, let's really be honest, it's totally misused. And I don't think that's a good thing to bring in to the county. Now, also, there was a lady that I spoke with, and uh, when she was trying to pass this marijuana, um, this bill, which did pass, um, she had, I asked her, well, what is your motive for wanting to pass this? And she said, it'll create jobs. And my question is to you and everybody, at what cost? I can, okay, we can do sex trafficking, we can do things like, you know, yeah, that'll bring money too, but is that really good for the heart and soul of the community? I mean, how many more impurities do you want to bring in? A lot of things are legal, but they're not good. So, and I just want, it was just an example. It's not, you know, I know it might be an extreme example, but when you start, when you start heading, when you start heading down Call of order. a road. Call of order. Oh, I'm sorry. What does that mean? I'm, Give your address. Please forgive me. I've, I've never done this before. So please, I don't, I didn't know that. And, uh, unfortunately, your time is okay. And I just want to say thank you so very much and have a good evening. Reginald R. Westfall again. Um, all I have to say is I appreciate what the two ladies just said. And I can tell you from personal experience in Salida, Colorado, when uh, we brought the marijuana in there and these shops popped up by the, by the, um, on Highway 50, where all the hotels are. Yeah, it did not improve the situation in Salida. So um, you can take that how it is. Anybody that says it's gonna get better is, is denying reality. And uh, it wasn't worth the cost uh, because uh, we got a lot of other things that are gonna cost a lot more here too. And uh, our Larimer County um, Sheriff's Office has trouble taking care of some things that we're gonna talk about later. And uh, you add that on to what's going on, gonna go on in marijuana. And I think that'll be very significant and costly. Thank you. Hi, Jesse Andreen again. Um, just to keep it short, I raised my kids really close to this property and I know that the people have spoken and I respect that, um, but I personally would 
would ask you to consider zoning at C1 as well. Thank you. Christine Gator, downtown core. I live in the downtown neighborhood, so like Angel. I know that this will affect our neighborhood. It's too close to the downtown neighborhood and it will affect us. If it could be somewhere else, that'd be great. Um, and just to mention the elephant in the room, the only three possibilities that are different between C1 and C3 are um, a drive-through, fast food drive-through, um, fuel sales, gas station, and a pot shop. So why are they asking for a C3? They can do anything other than those things. It's a small property. I doubt they wanna put a gas station there. I doubt they want to do a drive-through. Their picture doesn't have a drive-through. Their site plan doesn't have a, a drive-through. So it's too small for a drive-through. So um, the only thing they want, the reason they want C3 is a pot shop. And we don't want that near our neighborhood. Um, we already have crime with um, the, the shooting. Um, I guess it's robbery of a, a car at gunpoint in our neighborhood. Um, downtown neighborhoods are just just common to be the higher crime places. So you put a pop shop even closer, just crime's just gonna go even more up. And so we ask that they can do a bunch of um, commercial things with C1. We ask you that uh, you put it as C1 so that they can do any type of commercial except pot shop, gas station and drive through and keep our neighborhood safe. I mean. Once you guys can change it, it'd be great to put it in the industrial area so it's not close to the kids driving by for school, not close to people, um, kids going to Taco Bell or things like that. So um, put it away from, from the little eyes would be great. Thank you. done this before either I guess I say my name and my address yes Barb Holtgren 7342 viewpoint circle and just I, a moment can somebody turn their phone off please thank you <laughs> and feel free to talk right into it so everybody online can hear you too. um I had no premeditation to come up and talk but I appreciated Christine's um clarification of the c1 versus c3 mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about that the only thing I wanted to say is I kind of take offense to somebody from Johnstown coming and buying our property and sounds like their intention or we're thinking their intention is to put a marijuana dispensary here. I think if they want it, they could maybe buy property in Johnstown and do it there. Um, I personally don't want a marijuana dispensary in my town. So I just wanted to point out that I am kind of offended that they would want to put that here, but they don't live here. So thank you. Thank you. And am I supposed to find Yeah, but yeah. Any other further public? I'll sign after. Lowry Moyer, 3814 Harrison. I too live downtown and raise my children near this property. Um, my comment is as a citizen, but then also I have one comment as something that we heard in the commission um, for planning. They did discuss the possibility of a drive-through um, as a possibility for something they may do. So I just wanted to bring that up as that is not allowed in the zoning everyone else is talking about. Um, my comments would be that um, the decision was made as it's in line with everything the zoning map already has on it. And yes, we're gonna be making some changes to that, but um, it does fall in line with the direction the town wants to go. Also, um, I would question what legal implications we may have against us as a town for denying or making um, ordinance changes to a recommendation based on an assumption of what a possible use might be to a property, so. Thank you. Russ Brewer, 6679 Craneville Street. And just to add my uh, two cents to this as well, that 
Um, you all have been elected to lead and guide and direct our community, and you have an ability to uh, make decisions for us that help further the kind of community we would like to see Wellington become or be or stay. And a dispensary would not add to the kind of community that I think I'm looking for and several others as well, looking for as well. So in what I, obviously I would love to have uh, the owner have the freedom to do what they would want, but I also recognize that you have a responsibility to protect the, the nature of our community. And that's what zoning is for, is to allow for guidance and guidelines and, and um, guardrails for that kind of community. So if C1 allows for commercial, but does not allow for dispensaries, then that's the way to go. That's my voice as well. Thank you. Hearing no further comments from the public, we will now close the public hearing. Are there any closing comments from the applicant? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the board. Um, good to see uh, so many people come out tonight. I did take some somewhat copious notes. Forgive me if I miss anything. I was really more of a C student in school myself, um, but I'll try to do my very best here. Um, so uh, Ms. McDaniel mentioned, um, I'll try to encapsulate this into a very brief um, uh, summation of her remarks. Um, compatibility based on the size of the property, right? And that that is that that absolutely is um, is a concern when when this property does go through site plan review. Um, it's 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 really less of a concern at this point as 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 I mentioned. I mean, the, the onus is really truly on the applicant to find a, a workable solution. Um, she made some she she did speak um, to some concerns about potential signage on the property. Uh, obviously, signage is governed by your land use code. So, um, regardless of the Excuse use, me, one moment. Yes. Um, somebody's talking out in the crowd, and I'm having a hard time hearing the presenter. Gosh, that's an insult and a half. You can't hear me. <laughs> Jeez, holy moly! Um, your yeah, <laughs> your municipal code will govern and dictate the size and the coloration, almost every single aspect of signage. Not just signage, but landscaping as well to ensure that you have quality development, regardless of the use. Um, uh, Ms. Kinney, uh, hotel employer, uh, employee rather, no crime at the hotel, good job. I've been in the hotel, it's a wonderful place. I really enjoyed my, my, uh, my time there. Um, I met with, uh, with your boss, your owner, um, super guy, um, concerned with the potential marijuana shop. Um, I, I, I don't, look, I, the use is a separate item, but I'll just say it. If, whether the hotel is safe or, or unsafe has very little to do with what's going to happen. Uh, you know, I, I hired a guy to go out there and cut the trees down. There was a homeless guy with a vicious pit bull sleeping in the bushes on the property. Um, you know, and, and I, there was a little kid's bike in those bushes. Did, you want to talk about something that could have been dangerous if that dog, if that little girl who lost her bike, if she would have been riding there and that dog would have gotten away, that talk about a dangerous situation. Uh, I, I think that anything that we're going to do on this property is going to have the opposite effect. It's going to beautify that property. It's going to make it safer. And so um, I, I do, ex I appreciate your concern. Hell, I was county commissioner. I built a new jail. You're welcome, deputy. I built a new jail. I, I care about public safety. It's in my, it's, it's in my very being to care about it. And so, um, so I, I, I appreciate your remarks and, and, but I think that's, um, it's sort of an apples and oranges comparison, frankly. Um, uh, Mr. Westfall is a good dude. I sat, I've sat by him at three or four meetings. I like that guy. Um, he's a retired physician, super guy, not worth the cost. I don't know. That's a judgment call, right? I mean, I, I don't know. We don't, we don't have a, this is again, not looking at the use, looking at the zoning. And, and so I do appreciate him. He's a, he's a super guy. And I, I think we voted nearly identically. So, uh, but, but maybe we have, maybe there's something, um, that we, uh, where we, some areas where we disagree. Um, as the fourth speaker, I, there was a phone ringing. I didn't get her name. Um, and I, and I kind of, frankly, I didn't understand what she said. I mean, because of that phone background noise, um, I wrote down people have spoken. I, I don't know what I meant there. So I'm going to, my apologies, ma'am, whoever you were, um, that I didn't, uh, respond to your, your comments. 
Um, Mrs. Gator, uh, the other Mrs. Gator, the junior Mrs. Gator, I know the senior Mrs. Gator, although don't tell your mom I called her senior. Um, she, uh, she spoke about potential crime impacts uh, with the marijuana dispensary. Um, I, I, I can promise you whatever you, we, we hold public safety in the highest regard. I would not work for someone who did not, frankly. I mean, and, and, and so we, trust me when I say anything that we would do on that site, we will, we will fully uphold the law and the rules and all of the regulations of the state of Colorado and of your local ordinances, okay? And so uh, I do appreciate your comments, um, but, but understand that we take it very seriously. We, we, we take our, our roles as business owners, as developers, very, very seriously. Uh, Ms. Holdren, Mrs. Holdren, um, no marijuana. Again, I mean, I, again, not really about the use, about the zoning. Um, I guess I would just say there was an election and the, the people said that, that they wanted that, that type, they wanted to allow that type of use and they, they dictated what zoning district they wanted it in. Um, and, and I'm sure it was, I'm sure there was one or two people that probably voted for that thing because it was, because it was constrained by zoning to that interstate highway district. I mean, I don't know, not everybody, but I mean, there had to be a few votes that went that way because of the, because of the zoning, not in spite of it, because of it because they want it over there near the highway where the more intensive uses in your town are. And so um, not, that, not that this is a debate about that, but, um, but quite frankly, um, we, we intend to, if, if in the event that, that we did go forward with this type of application, this type of use, we'd seek to uphold the will of the voters. And, and frankly, it gives you a, a fairly um, good position to be in as well. It's the smallest commercial property in the whole town. You had a very narrow election and you put the use on the, on the potentially the smallest, least impactful property that you could find in the entire community. I mean, actually makes a little bit of sense if that's what you were gonna do. And again, it's not what we're talking about, but it's, there is a certain logic there, right? It has to be. Um, Ms. Myers, we should put you on the payroll. Geez, um, you actually, uh, Moyers, Ms. Moyers, we should put you on the payroll. You actually made a point that I needed to make during my presentation. I'd inadvertently um, put it incorrectly in our, in our planning commission packet. And I did say on the record, for a, actually a lot of the folks who were here actually heard it. Um, we do fully intend to, to have a drive-through on this property, I mean, it's one of the main reasons we need um, C3 zoning is because we need to have access to a drive-through. And, and we were just out there looking at it before we came in here. We think it's, it's gonna be possible to accommodate that. And, and frankly, it, makes, it, it would lessen our parking impacts. It would have a lot of positive effects if we could get that drive-through in. So, so for the applicant, there's a lot of good reasons why we'd wanna see it um, able to be developed in that way. And so, um, uh, we fully intend to put a drive-through in here. That's our complete and utter intention to do so. Um, oh my gosh. Oh, Russ Brewer, uh, the last gentleman, I guess, that spoke, closed us out. Um, Anti-dispensary, again. Uh, your charge here today is to look at this, this property, um, determine whether it's um, eligible, it's eligibility for annexation, which I think we've all acknowledged that it is, and then set the zoning for this property. I, I, I understand people's concerns. I fully do. I, I sat in your seat. I probably, I probably sat in, in those chairs for a thousand land use hearings myself, all right? And so, so I do understand the concerns of folks, um, but I also understand that you have to fulfill your obligation, which is in part to the property owner and to the code right? Perhaps more importantly, to the code. And, and so um, we talked about that. There was a property that came forward um, a couple of weeks ago that was seeking rezoning. We talked about that property and some of the obvious impacts that it could cause. We look at this property and we don't, we don't see that same type of level of potential impacts with this zoning. In fact, it would be very difficult to make the case, quite honestly, that anything other than C3 zoning was really appropriate on this site. So um, I, I don't know if there's any questions from the, from the, the board um, based on the, on the public comment, but I'd be happy to answer those questions. 
questions, but I have some for Cody. Very good. I'll hang back. Go for it. So, Cody, page 78 of 162, item G. Any, develop, any development within annexed territory shall comply with the Town of Wellington Comprehensive Plan. So if you look at the Town of Wellington's Comprehensive Plan, that is not even zoned commercial in our comp plan right now. So if you actually go and look at the comp plan, it's not zoned as commercial. So can we even do anything with this annexation to go against what our document with the town of Wellington is stating? Because this says petition for annexation into unincorporated territory of the county, but it says here in item G, any development within the annexed territory shall comply with the town of Wellington comprehensive master plan. So can you rephrase that as a question? You said, I, I understand that the, there's, you're getting to something that if you could just rephrase it for me, that would help out. Um, so to rephrase it, can we even vote to place a C3 here? Absolutely. How is that? Because this actually goes directly against any development within annexed territory shall comply with the Town of Wellington Comprehensive Master Plan. And the master plan does not call for that. So, okay, well, I'll, I think I understand what you're asking. If I miss it, stop me and we'll circle back. The comprehensive plan identifies a future land use for every property in town. I think if, and I don't have that map in front of me tonight, um, but I think what you're referring to is that the future land use map identifies uh, this this area as um, downtown neighborhoods, I believe mm -hmm. is, is how it's identified. Yeah. In considering zoning for a property, there are a list of 10 uh, findings that the Planning Commission and the Board of Trustees evaluates and town staff provided town staff's interpretation of what that consideration might look like. The comprehensive plan consideration is one of those considerations. Um, and I believe what the staff report says is that the during the comprehensive plan adoption process, some of these areas were <coughs> contemplated as being downtown neighborhoods because the consideration during comp plan adoption was that the downtown neighborhoods would include a number of permitted commercial uses within that category. And throughout the process of updating the town's zoning regulations, uh, a series of decisions were made that removed a number of those commercial opportunities and commercial uses from the downtown neighborhoods. And so the staff report says, um, again, staff's recommendation that the planning commission adopted was that during the adoption of the comprehensive plan, because there were different uses considered, it was appropriate to consider or rethink uses acceptable for properties based on the zoning code that was adopted that changed the intent as we went through those procedures. And to get into the question, is it, is it possible to consider a specific zoning for this property? Absolutely. And we can assign the annexation and the zoning separately. So if we want to say, yes, we'll annex, but we want to annex under C1, we are allowed to do that. So again, as part of the process of annexation, when a property is brought into the town limits from the unincorporated county, it loses its county zoning designation. So it, it, when you bring it into the town, it needs to have a zoning category assigned to it. The board has the ultimate decision on making the zoning designation assignment. Um, town staff and the planning commission have provided their recommendation based on a series of findings that's used in considering zoning within the town of Wellington. Oh, sorry. No, that one. <laughs> Trustee Regan. Yes, I am done. Got a question. As it stands right now, with that house right across the street, could a marijuana shop be put on that place? I believe this is about zoning. Well, I mean, that would still, I mean, 
that is part of the discussion and they need to know. I mean, with, you know, with the uh, size of the lot, the direction of the lot, how it is next to that house, would that be a possible use? That's part of the zoning, okay? And I think, I think the, per, uh, the buyer of the property needs to know that too. I'll, I'll give you a chance, of, or the mayor may give you a chance. Um, I'll, I want to first respond to Trustee Wiegand's uh, comments and question. Uh, when the town is considering zoning, you're considering all of the uses allowed in that district, um, and not a, not one particular but use. That is one of the all. Okay. So when you're considering zoning, you look at, at all of the uses that are permitted. The zoning consideration is what can that dirt be used for. And once a zoning district is assigned, any use allowed in that zoning district is assigned is a permitted use. Um, it's still subject to development standards, um, site development plans, sign codes, all those other um, elements of the, of the zoning code. But the zoning designation is considering what are the allowed uses on that particular property. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thanks for the question, Trustee. Um, I, I can tell you, um, the the setbacks required for a dispenser are based on ballot language who are approved by your citizens in this community they dictate what the setbacks would be um it's uh you know from schools from from day, licensed daycares from uh residential zone properties from from uh, from other dispensaries um any a, a number a long a, like a real a really um comprehensive list of of uh, uses that you have setbacks from. And so um, any property that would seek licensure would have to satisfy those setbacks, plain and simple, would have to meet those setbacks as dictated by the voters of this community. So for instance, there's a, there's a licensed daycare center almost directly across the road, right across the interstate. Now the ballot language doesn't exempt the interstate, even though it feels like 10 miles away with the, 20,000 trucks zooming by, it doesn't dictate that, right? And so any owner or, or, or applicant that sought that licensure would have to satisfy those setbacks, plain and simple. It's a, it's a built-in safeguard um, that the voters chose to put to place on, on the use, Good right? Job. It was there's actually very responsible. So any, any applicant would have to satisfy those setbacks one way or another. So is the setback from the property or from the building? You want me to answer? It's, well, again, we'll, we'll, go we, back, we'll go back to Mr. Bird, please. Okay. We're going down a bad road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, Mayor, I, my suggestion would be, I mean, we're happy to provide answers to questions. It does feel a little bit like you're getting into deliberations and the topic of this first yeah. agenda is to conduct a public hearing. So questions of a, of a nature that are relative to the public comments that you've heard, procedural questions, things of that nature, we're happy to respond to. I just would caution you not to go down the path of deliberation, which would be your next agenda item. Or, or questions you. about based on my testimony to you tonight. I mean, I'd be happy to answer those questions, right? Yeah, it'd be very appropriate. Mr. Mayor Pro Trustee Mason. Okay. Nope, I have items for the next section. Just get her. Okay. I have no further questions. Um, moving on, we have the ordinance number one two dash two. For the board. I, I'm sorry. I I mean, to, Mr. Mayor, may I? I my apologies. Um, it it would be informative to me uh, to know if Trustee McDonald intends to vote on this item tonight. Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, I apologize for my tardy absence. I was at the elementary school graduation celebration for fifth graders for my son. Immediately following that, my eighth grade daughter graduated at the new high school. So I was listening in. I did hear public comment before, and I am prepared to vote this evening. I do not have a conflict of interest. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for um, accepting the question. All right, moving on. We have Ordinance number 12-2022, an ordinance conditionally annexing the lamb annexation into the town of Wellington. Mr. Bird, do you have anything further to add? Well, I'll keep it concise. Um, the, there's a draft ordinance um, in your packet 
The way that ordinance was drafted was based off of what staff heard at the planning commission hearing. Um, and so the ordinance does two things, uh, if adopted, of course, and, and the board can of course consider amendments if you'd choose to talk through those. But what the draft in your packet includes and approving the annexation to bring the property into the town of Wellington and assigning the um, C3 mixed use commercial zoning based on the applicant's request and the staff and the planning commission recommendations based on those findings. Um, additionally, um, we did include the, the findings of fact, uh, the, the factors that are evaluated in making a zoning assignment in this portion of the staff report. Um, the planning commission's recommendations are in the prior agenda item. We didn't want to attach it twice, just add extra length. But we did include the findings if you want to go through those as the board makes its findings for this particular uh, item. And so when you're considering an annexation, you have to do a couple of things. Um, you need to approve or deny the annexation request. You need to adopt specific findings of fact, assign a zoning district designation to the property, and take action on the ordinance. We've included a couple of, of motions for you um, in your agenda packet that are options the board has. The staff recommended option based on the Planning Commission's recommendation and findings is to adopt Ordinance 12-2022. I'm happy to answer any questions. I just had a quick procedural <clears throat> question. Um, I don't believe we have set in place anything official, um, but up, I know in our discussion last week and in previous, we've not allowed participation in quasi-judicial matters over remote. I know Trustee McDonald is here now. I, I'm fine either way, but I just want to make sure that we're not going to get in trouble for doing things inconsistently on different bases. So I want to just ask. The primary reason for not allowing um, participation remotely is that the decision that the board need makes needs to be based on the record that's presented to the entire board. And with a member participating from somewhere else, that we're, we're not totally sure uh, what information that person has access to at that time. So um, Trustee McDonald, can participate here. Um, I, the decision needs to be based on findings in the record. So the the a key point here is going to be, I think, number two in Cody's list of items that need to be done, which is adopt findings of fact. And so here, as part of the board deliberation, you need to adopt findings of fact that are supported by the record. And so with that deliberation, with the consideration of findings of fact that will be adopted, if Trustee McDonald believes that she has sufficient information to make a judgment, that's it. That, that works. But it's about what the absent person has access to. That, that's the reason that we've uh, said no participation remotely. Okay, perfect. I have no issue with that. I just wanted to ask the question because we were kind of this weird middle ground. I, I think it's a very good question. It's something we were over here talking, to whispering to ourselves <laughs> and trying to, th trying to think through. Yeah. Um, and, but I, I did need to review the record. If you need to watch the video, um, you, you could potentially. I, I think that's that's 100% right. If Trustee McDonald does not believe that based on the conversation that's the deliberations that are had here, including the discussion of findings of fact that must be supported by the record, if she believes she doesn't have enough information, continuing this consideration of the or postponing consideration of this ordinance to a later date and giving Trustee McDonald sufficient time to watch the YouTube video to see what was done here today, that would certainly be an option as well. I apologize, Was she, Trustee McDonald, were you listening virtually? Did you get to hear public comments and? Um, I did not hear the public comment immediately preceding this. I heard the public comment at the very beginning of the meeting and the tail end of the work session. I did not hear the presentation of the applicant and I heard one, public participants comment, clearly. Um, I heard uh, the applicant state that there was some may we, issues over the phone and that was when I tapped in. May we take a five minute recess to seek legal counsel? I second. Do, okay, sorry. we need a second yes. for a recess. We've got a vote. Aye. 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 Aye.
Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity to take a pause and make a thoughtful decision regarding the matter. Um, I've read the packet thoroughly. Um, I understand the information and what the applicant is asking for. However, due to the, the public perception of the situation, I'm going to respectfully request that we postpone so that I can review the public comment in its entirety. Um, I would just ask that legal counsel give us a quick overview of what we need to make sure that we do between now and the next time if we do postpone. To postpone, um, so that would be, first of all, the, the motion tonight would be a motion to postpone this to a to a future date. And I think our next board meeting is June 14th. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. um, so because of the way the, the months fall, that's actually several weeks away. And it's very important for the board between now and June 14th to avoid all ex parte communications. So we're postponing the hearing here, which is where the record is created to then deliberate about it in the future. So in the next three weeks, we need to, the board needs to be very conscientious about not confusing that record. Um, the record kind of pauses now. So if the public comes up to you and says, I wanna talk about this, this proposal, you need to say that's a matter, that is a matter that is before the board for consideration. And um, I need to make my decision based on the law and on based on the record presented. That record has been created, so um, the ordinance. So we'll. So it's kind of an interesting one. We'll delay, postpone consideration of the ordinance and the deliberation, but the record is set. And if you have questions about that, definitely let me know. And it's only about the land annexation that we cannot discuss at all. And zoning. And zoning of that. The the, right. the the matter before us. It's the the land annexation. It's about anything else. We can the talk. the zoning of this of this particular property. Just the, that's it. Yes. I had a question for Mr. Sapienza. So, with the record being created, are we continuing the public hearing and the ordinance, or just the deliberations? I, I believe the public hearing has closed at okay. this point, and that's what I'm. Okay. So perfect. So the that's record what is. That's what I'm saying. The record yep. is. It's set. It's set. Um, what is being continued is consideration of the ordinance itself. And I do not believe consideration of the ordinance allows for public comment. Got it. Okay. So I'm now debating what happens at the beginning of the next meeting when we have the open public comment period, and we'll come up with an answer for that uh, between now and then. But I mean, okay. so the, we're continuing the deliberation. Okay. The public hearing has been but from this standpoint regardless of what people think there's no more input from public at this standpoint what was given tonight that is our public input that we are allowed by law to consider yeah. and then we have to take that time um well allow trustee mcdonald a chance to review that record and then we can discuss that at the next meeting but if someone wants to come and speak again we aren't allowed to take that into consideration that's correct okay. and similarly the applicant is has submitted its materials so i mean Nobody gets to add to the record at this point. <laughs> it, it, it is set. Okay. Um, so we will basically include in the packet, I believe we'll probably include in the packet during the next meeting exactly what's in the packet here here tonight. So I do have a few comments if if you allow some deliberation right now, if, if that would be okay or if we should save all I that. I mean, we're, we're discussing whether or not we want what we want to do with this. Yeah. Okay, sure. So I, I, I heard some really concerning items in the conversation uh, amongst the board, and I want to clarify or maybe make sure that I'm on the right track. So, uh, and mostly my concerns are discussing specific uses rather than zoning districts. Um, and I heard a lot of references to the, the how um, everybody voted and those kind of things. I do want to make it really clear that within those ordinances, a specific zone was requested and setbacks. And those are the defining factors for marijuana dispensaries, right? And those were the will of the people and how they voted. So that is separate and that is known. Um, a big concern I have 
as if we focus and repeatedly reference a marijuana dispensary and use that as the defining reason to not grant C3. That is really concerning because then we are voting or not providing that zoning district based on one specific use. So very purposely. And I don't know if that's very defensible in our decision. So I just wanna be very cautious. And again, I don't know if that's the case, but it sounds kind of scary to me. Um, the other things that I wanna recommend as we're reviewing this, if we were to continue this, this conversation at our next meeting, is that we should really focus on those 10 findings um, included within our packet that are defensible reasons for making this decision. Um, we may have a lot of uh, emotional discussions and those kind of things, but really we have to make sure that during a hearing, we're using the facts provided and proving the reasons as to why we're making that decision. And those are shown within our packet. For example, I just wanna make sure we're reading on page 64, referencing to the planning commission's recommendations based on those findings, you'll see one is the character of the neighborhood. This is a factual description. There's not much more con contribution that we need to do as long as you agree that these are the facts as to what this property looks like. Two, the zoning and land uses properties nearby. Again, this is a factual use and it shows exactly what it is. There's really no interpretation for that. That is listed, that's the facts. Um, suitability of the subject property for the uses to which it has been restricted. So number three, that's talking about how it's currently being used and that has those details again. Um, all, most of that is just factual information. Um, the extent to which the removal of the restrictions will detrimentally affect nearby property. So, and so on. And you look at the ones that are specific as to recommendations from the Planning Commission. That's why they're in here. These are very important for um, our consideration is understanding the recommendations um, from the Planning Commission who's gone through a similar process and had similar public hearing. And this is here for us to help us make this decision. So as you go through those four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, I would want to make sure that when we're doing our deliberations and we're discussing this, that we are speaking within those pieces. I think if we if detour from that, um, or if we mention that this decision is based on one specific use when we're really talking about entire zoning, um, we are not doing ourselves justice or the applicant's justice or the community justice. Um, there's an ordinance in place regarding dispensaries for that reason that were determined by our voters. So that, that was the point I wanted to make. So I just really hope that we stick within those pieces to make sure our decision is defensible. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, so I wanted to get a little clarity because if we're going to enter into deliberations, that needs to be clear. But if we're postponing, I don't think we we're, should be yeah, going into yeah, deliberations. Exactly. So exactly. I would like to, I think that I would like to grant the opportunity for Trustee McDonald to be able to be a full part of this. So I'd like to move that we postpone the, let's see, this would be item number four, ordinance number 12-2022, an ordinance conditionally annexing the land and annexation into the town of Wellington to our June 14th meeting. I second that. May I get a roll call? Trustee Teets? Yes. Yes. Trustee Gator? Yes. Trustee Kenny? Yes. Trustee Mason? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McDonald? The applicants. Okay, with that David. Yes, we're yes. good. We're good. Thank you for asking. We'll be here. Mayor Shosi. Yes. As part of avoiding ex parte communications between now and June 14th, I want to also remind the board that. Um, I would recommend against individual research on this topic. We have a very eager board to do some research um, and that would be outside of the record. So we really need to make this decision and deliberation on June 14th be this record created tonight only. Quick question. We have the, I don't know if this is it possible or not. We have the email that goes out automatically to all the trustees. Is there a way to set that up to change for a couple of weeks so that can be just, maybe it just comes to me and then if it's forwarded on as long as it's not marijuana. I mean if they email us directly, they email us directly. But if there's a way to maybe change that link to for like two weeks to where it, if it's marijuana related, we get that later. 
Well, or this specific, not marijuana general, but this specific item. If we can look into okay. that, that might help. Absolutely. Good idea. We'll look into that. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. The next resolution. Or, yeah, resolution number 21 2022, resolution authorizing temporary road closures for the annual 4th of July celebration. Mrs. Cooper. Good evening, Mayor and Trustees. Um, yes, I am. Let me bring this up for you guys. Um, I did want to point out tonight um, at the beginning of the meeting, you should have gotten a few pages that were a modification to the traffic control plans that I received this morning. Um, those traffic controls, those plans now reflect um, your resolution. So um, just wanted to make that clear. Um, so just a quick brief overview, um, 4th of July celebration, Monday, July 4th, 2022. Um, we conduct three separate road closures as part of the entirety of this day. Um, the first road closure is the closure of Cleveland Avenue for the parade. Um, that closure begins at 6 a.m. in the morning, ends at 12 p.m. And then we have the road closure of Buffalo Creek Parkway starting at Washington Avenue and going north. Um, that also runs from 6 a.m. to 12 p.m. And then the third road closure we have is along 6th Street, starting at Grant Avenue to Washington Avenue. And that is from 2 p.m. until midnight. Um, so I'm here to answer any questions. I wanted to point out in the traffic control plans, I don't expect you guys to, <laughs> to know all of the symbols and everything like that, um, but the road closure barricades are actually the white boxes with the orange diagonal slashes. So there's a lot of symbols, there's a lot of signs, but those are where the actual road closures are happening. Um, these have been reviewed by Wellington Fire and LCSO, um, but they are draft plans. We still are working and obviously we had a change this morning, but, um, but those have been reviewed by those organizations. Any comments or questions from the board? Trustee Peets. Okay, so I just want to verify that all of the one-way routing away from Wellington Community Park has been adjusted. Because um, every street, so if you, I apologize, you're talking about Buffalo Creek Parkway? No, I'm talking about Cleveland Avenue how the traffic pattern was initially set up in our pad in our packet it one wayed all of the traffic trying to go towards wellington community park after the parade it one wayed them away from getting to washington so they could actually go to the festival so it is page 96 of 162. So if you look on McKinley, all of the roads are routed backwards. So we have a shuttle bus that will be running from Centennial Park to Wellington Community Park on 3rd Street and you have traffic going against the way the shuttle is trying to travel. Oh, I see what you're talking about. Um, yes, I can have those particular signs removed. Um, I think it is, I think they had them backward as far as where you could turn. Um, oh, this is, are you talking about Cleveland Avenue or Roosevelt Avenue? So uh, I'm McKinley. So if you go to page 96 and you look at McKinley. Right. So that's running south. So that's saying that the cars can only turn south, not turn. So they can't turn north towards Cleveland Avenue. So they're running. So, so they McKinley, so Roosevelt is south of McKinley. You can't go to Main Street because of the parade. So saying that all the cars that if they're traveling, south 
either on, <clears throat> so from Cleveland Avenue South, they have to go south. They can't go north to Cleveland Avenue. Okay, so, and the same is assigned to the opposite side of Cleveland? Um, I don't believe they have any directional signs that are north of Cleveland. Um, I don't think they have that. They do not have that in the traffic control plan at this time. Okay, got it. So, and we are positive that we can have a safe travel from Centennial Park to Wellington Community Park. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. it will be busy. Yeah. It, it absolutely will be busy streets. Sixth Street is busy. Third Street will be busy. County Road 9 will be busy. Um, but there's nothing through in the traffic control plan that would prevent them from going north from Cleveland Avenue up to Wellington Community Park. Except that Sixth Street was completely closed off. That's been adjusted though, correct? Correct. That street will not close until 2 p.m. this year. Okay. So last year, the, the issue came because that street was closed first thing in the morning. And so they could not get up Sixth Street. Um, that will not happen this year. Got it. No, I'm talking about the one at Sixth in Cleveland, not the one over by the middle school. I, I understand what you're saying. So, right, there will be no road closure of Sixth in Cleveland um, until, 2 p until after 2 p.m. Okay. Yep, those were my only questions. I We've sat through and looked. We looked through some of it. We didn't get to see all the traffic plan for CAC board. We only saw a percentage of it. So the first time it actually came to me fully was in our packet. Um, so I just wanted to verify that people were still having places to park. Um, the other one, 99, page 99, I have all of the road closed for people to actually park along the side streets. Are those removed or did they stay in place? Because I don't know where we plan on parking people if they can't actually go down Garfield, Hayes, or Grant. Um, once again, um, Page 99 has been modified. So that is in your new documents. So um, Hayes and Garfield will be, will both be open. Actually Grant will be open as well. Um, so the road closure won't start until after Grant. So that was that modification that I had um, um, at your. Got it. So people can work for the parade. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Nothing else. Yep. No questions. Any comments from the public regarding this agenda item? No. Okay, bring back the board for final comment. So hard, Miss Cooper, for all your research and hard work. You've put a lot of time in over the years refining these road closures and coordinating these events. Thank you for all of that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this presentation. I know this is usually a consent, but I, uh, I pulled it because I wanted the public to know what roads were being closed. So uh, I know it took time and effort to do that, but I appreciate it. Thank you. And we will continue to send out information to the public as well. Um, that's important to us um, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, hearing no further comments, I would like to seek a motion. I move to approve resolution number 21-2022. I'll second. May I get a roll call? Trustee Gator. Yes. Trustee Kenny. Yes. Trustee Mason. Yes. Yes. Trustee Wiegand. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem McDonald. Yes. Mayor Shosi. Yes. Now we have ordinance number 13-2022, an ordinance prohibiting the use of state prohibited fireworks in the town of Wellington. Mr. Sapienza. Sergeant Cherry left. I would assume we have something happening because he walked out the door in a hurry. <laughs> okay, well, uh, Dan Sapienza with Martin Olive LLC, uh, town attorney. I think you're going to have a lot of questions that Sergeant Cherry is the appropriate person to answer those questions, and I'll do my best because we we did meet with uh, Sergeant Cherry and, and with the sheriff's, uh, sheriff's office. Um, that in, I did. So hopefully I can answer those questions. Um, if I can't, we'll maybe wait until Sergeant Cherry gets back, if he comes back. 
Um, so in front of you is ordinance number, proposed ordinance number 13, 2022, an ordinance prohibiting the use of state prohibited fireworks within the town of Wellington in order to facilitate enforcement. Um, at the last meeting, it was brought up that uh, there's some concern in the community about or, uh, fireworks being shot off around the holidays. Um, certainly we all know right around 4th of July, probably starting about mid-June is when the fireworks season really gets going and we all enjoy our neighbors shooting off large fireworks displays with scare dogs and children and make life somewhat difficult. So at the last meeting it was brought up that the board would like to see some potential changes to town code um, to facilitate enforcement and to increase um, enforcement of by law enforcement. So we had a few meetings. We had a lot of discussion about how we might be able to do this. Lair or Wellington's municipal code currently prohibits the use of all fireworks except sparklers between June 30th and July 5th. Um, under state law, actually a number of fireworks are permitted. That includes fountains and spinners and ground effects and things that don't make a lot of noise. Um, but in the town of Wellington, th those items are prohibited. They cannot be possessed, they cannot be used, they cannot be sold. The only items that are permitted in the town of Wellington are sparklers um, between the dates of June 30th and July 5th. Now, as I mentioned at the last meeting, I think in the town attorney report, um, we did some research into uh, court records for the municipal court. And since at least 2016, there's not been a single court summons for violation of the fireworks code. So that's quite a number of years that we've not seen anything on this. The uh, presumptive fine in the municipal court is 500, currently is $500 for a first offense. Uh, that's a, it's a high fine. It's not as high as some communities, but it's higher than some others. Um, but being for a first offense, that is far and above higher than any other similar ordinance violation in the town. Um, for a non-criminal violation of town code, the maximum fine that can be imposed by the municipal court is $1,000. The town code does have some criminal offenses, and for those, the maximum fine that can be imposed by the municipal court is $2,650. But the fireworks ordinance is has never been defined as a criminal offense. It's a municipal violation. Um, and therefore the, the highest potential fine on it is, is $1,000. So a $500 fine for that first offense is, is rather high. Of course, this doesn't have significant impact when nobody's actually come to court for a violation of this. So in meeting with Larimer County Sheriff's Office, th they've proposed some changes to our municipal code to make enforcement a little more consistent with other communities and with the state. During 4th of July, they bring in a number of deputies that actually serve in other areas, specifically Berthoud is, is one area that a lot of deputies kind of serve both areas and also unincorporated Larimer County, of course. And in Berthoud, the municipal code says that all fireworks prohibited except those that are permitted by state law. So it then uses the state definition. Makes it pretty easy for residents because if they go down to the fireworks stand that's open down the street in unincorporated Larimer County and they buy spinners and ground effects and sparklers, those are legal. The general rule is if you can buy it in Larimer County, you can use it in Berthoud or you can use it in unincorporated Larimer County unless there's a fire ban, of course. Um, and so the idea was to change Wellington's municipal code to mirror those. So when those other deputies come in that don't normally serve within the town of Wellington or the reserve deputies with the sheriff's office, they could come into town of Wellington and have a consistent rule, which is state permitted fireworks would be permitted within the town of Wellington and other fireworks would not, um, as opposed to right now, which is act, it, it's less restrictive than what we have now, but it would allow for perhaps better enforcement, more consistent enforcement. And if residents were able to use those fireworks that were that could be purchased down the street in Larimer County, perhaps they'd feel less inclined to go up to Wyoming to get the really offensive ones that make a lot of noise. <laughs> Hopefully, maybe. Um, it might also be easier for residents to know what they can and can't do. Uh, having a code that says sparklers between June 30th and July 5th is it's a little hard to identify, though it's pretty broad. So just don't use them, I suppose, is what the town code says now. Um, so we drafted the proposed ordinance that, that's in front of you. I apologize for the, the slight difference in formatting of the proposed changes. I, I usually wouldn't use underlining and strike throughs, which I personally love because it shows the changes. But in this case, we we're only changing a couple specific parts of this code. So I thought it would, it would be clearer rather than presenting you with a proposed code and you'd say, well, what's different? 
So what we're doing is we're removing all the bit about allowing sparklers, um, changing it to say that all fireworks are prohibited in the town except those permissible fireworks enumerated in uh, Colorado revised statutes. And then clarifying that that's even only allowed when the party possessing or igniting that is over the age of 16 or is under the supervision of somebody over the age of 16. That's kind of copying some language that um, I removed from later in this section. So making sure that even if you're using permissible state permitted fireworks, you still have to be over 16 in order to use them. Um, the other change is then in section B, uh, again, clarifying the, uh, that we're allowing permissible fireworks as defined by the state statutes. And then in section D, I made a kind of a clerical change there to make sure it was referencing the actual current law, not one that has nothing to do with fireworks anymore that was repealed years ago. Um, so that would be the change. Now, this doesn't guarantee enhanced enforcement. This doesn't necessarily mean that the law, uh, Laramie County Sheriff's Office is gonna be writing more tickets, but the idea was to make it more consistent and help them understand the law, apply the law uniformly throughout the municipalities and the unincorporated Laramie County. Um, and also in conversations with them, we had some, we, I wish Sergeant Cherry was here because we had some ideas about perhaps some information that we could start gathering um, to help enforcement now and in the future, and also maybe inform decisions about how this code could be changed later. One of those was um, regarding written warnings. Currently, uh, many times when Lerma County Sheriff's deputies are called out to a site, they give verbal verbal warnings. Uh, we did get a, I had a report from them about all of the calls from 2021. And Lerma County Sheriff's deputies responded to 57 calls in 2021 regarding fireworks. And in well over half of those, the fireworks have gone by the time they got there, they couldn't find the source of the fireworks. Um, so there's kind of no response. In the other of those, which was the fewer than half, um, in a number of them, it simply said verbal warning given. So in talking with them about how maybe we could help understand what they're doing and to maybe give this a little more, give that warning a little more oomph, I suppose, was to for the sheriff's office to start writing, writing written warnings to anybody. So there might be cases, the reason they might give a warning rather than a citation, an example of what they provided was often if they're called out to somebody shooting off a bunch of mortars, it's not just one guy or woman standing around with the lighter in hand lighting a fuse. It's a, it's a block party. It's a bunch of people standing around a bunch of fireworks. So when the sheriff deputies pull up there, they then have to decide if they had to write a ticket, they would then have to decide who among these 20 people shut off the fireworks. That gets kind of dicey. And because if they write a summons and it goes to municipal court, if they wrote a summons to all 20 of those people and it came to municipal court, we would have to throw out most of those anyway, because in order to issue a fine that we have a certain standard of proof that needs to be met. And all a person would have to say is, I didn't have the lighter, I didn't use it. So it presents a real problem. So that, that's why there is discretion in law enforcement and whether they issue a ticket or not. So with Lambert County, County Sheriff's Office committing to giving written warnings, I think that might go a little further than just the verbal warnings that we have now without bringing a bunch of people into court that we then have to dismiss cases. Um, so so that, that, was, that was one thing I think was uh, real positive. Another issue with issuing citations, uh, many, many more citations, is anytime a sheriff's deputy or officer, I always call them deputies and I hope that's the correct term for the sheriff's office. Um, anytime they issue a citation and somebody has fireworks, they then need to confiscate those fireworks and their evidence. So it's not just that they have to confiscate them, take them somewhere and dispose of them. They actually have to take all the fireworks, log them into evidence to be stored for court for trial because it is physical evidence. And so for Larimer County Sheriff's deputies coming up to Wellington right now, if they issue a citation and they have to uh, say in the height of the merriment of 4th of July, when a lot of stuff is going on and a lot of people are in town, if they issue a citation and they have to take those fireworks and log them into evidence, they estimate that that's at least an hour and a half that that deputy is then out of Wellington because there is no place in Wellington or there's only one place in the county really that they can take fireworks for safe storage to log them into evidence. So 
if they had to issue a lot more citations and they didn't have that discretion, they probably would even cite fewer people or contact fewer people because they would be spending most of their time traveling to Fort Collins and back. We thought, we, we did ask if there was a possibility, of, well, could we have a, a facility here in Larimer County or in, in Wellington where so they don't have to travel to Fort Collins to store the fireworks to, to get rid of them, saving that travel time. And they're actually looking into it. it, it not opposed to the idea, but it is evidence. So it needs to be under the control of the sheriff's office. So I'm not sure there's really a viable option there. Um, I'll leave it there. I, there's, this is, we've looked at a whole lot of issues. I, I know this ordinance doesn't totally get at what was maybe requested previously. I think this does get at and give an opportunity to have some reliable, consistent enforcement. And I think this combined with the partnership with Lambert County Sheriff's Office to move to written warnings rather than verbal warnings. And, and, and there's some language in here, you know, encouraging them to up enforcement. I think we can partner with them and, and have a better season. And then maybe in July, later in July, maybe in August or September when we're having a downtime, we'll be able to actually review records that are a little better so we'll know how many written warnings they issued. We'll know what they did, and maybe we'll be able to think of some, some improvements that can be put in place for future years. So any questions? The hard part is the questions I have for, for Sergeant Kerr. Sure. Um, and and, and uh, Ms. Garcia and I were in a lengthy meeting with the Sheriff's Office, so we can try to answer your sure. questions, but of course, so um, you talked a little bit about the concerns with um, citing people. Um, and I agree at very minimum, we need to have the written warnings. I mean, it's I understand that half of them, they weren't able to do anything last year, but that's still concerning that we had somewhere around 20 something that were still just given a verbal warning. Um, that, that to me is like, <laughs> it's a lot of people to just be saying, hey, don't you shouldn't be doing this. Like, I, to me, that's not enforcement <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that half of them were verbal warnings on more than half they couldn't locate anybody okay of the rest of them a certain number were verbal warnings and as we saw with the um Lamar county sheriff's office report i think at one of the last meetings and and sergeant cherry talked about this is the information that goes into the system and it's not okay. always all that clear um it's not totally clear what happened on those 20 cases 20 okay. some odd. so i don't want to say they're all verbal warnings but a, a, certainly a good number of them were. okay um, the other thing too, that was, cause I actually had a conversation with an, another member of law enforcement. They are not with LCSO, so they might have different policies. Um, but I was discussing this concern with them and they were just saying it was ludicrous that you have to store the fireworks. They were saying what they do is they collect those, throw them in a tub, they take pictures of it. And that's what they use as evidence in court. So they were, were shocked at the idea of you have to maintain the fireworks so that you can take them to court. You know, like that's what you have cameras for. So I don't, again, this is a... <laughs> LCSO question like, okay, maybe this person's information is out of date. I don't know. Um, I did have a question about increasing the minimum fine. Um, and I know that's in our purview as the board or town to determine if we want to raise that from 500 to 1,000. Um, and then I know the other question I'd asked was about having additional law enforcement on hand. Um, and I'll just read the answer that he had given. This is something we can post for overtime positions. And this is an email sent to the whole board, um, but would ultimately be dependent on who would volunteer for this assignment with commitment of reserves during the busy parade and festival. It may be difficult, but not impossible to request additional reserves for fireworks enforcement later in the evening. So that was another question about bringing additional people in to maybe be able to respond quicker and maybe actually catch people doing it. We talked a lot about that with him, um, with Sergeant Cherry in the Sheriff's Office, and they do always try and bring in additional deputies, especially for 4th of July. They also use reserve units. And I mean, some years they use reserve units solely tasked with fireworks. Um, and so that's something they, they really try to do. But of course, around 4th of July, all communities need a little bit extra <laughs> enforcement. Um, so I think they're, they're stretched pretty thin on those dates. Um, in some other communities, um, I know in Fort Collins, Poudre Valley Fire Authority has people out, has fire officials out talking to folks. Um, but I mean, that's something that we'd have to talk with Wellington Fire Protection District about 
for a future future time. And it's and for this or for for Fort Collins, it was a I think it's more of a vehicle shows up with a siren or with a flashing lights and says don't do that. It's they may not have the authority to cite, but at least it's a hey don't do that. That's against the law and it could cause a fire danger. I mean that's there are potentially other solutions. Right? Is that something we could have staff talk with the fire district to see if they'd be willing to do something with us this year? Or I don't know. I mean it's pretty short notice at this point, but we I could certainly. I imagine that that is like one of their busiest days of the entire year. So, I mean, it's fire, they're responding to fire. So I would, I would be willing to guess that they are not willing to volunteer on that day. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we can't really speak for them. But, um, any further questions, Trustee Green? No, not really at this point. I guess the only thing I'd like to see is maybe increasing the fine. Um, I would prefer to very strongly avoid the warnings and go a lot more towards actually enforcing where we can, but I also understand there are logistical issues with that. So I, I'm not sure how to overcome those. I do have some questions. So uh, some, like you stated, you might be able to answer and some might have to be deferred to Sergeant Sherry. Um, so let's say we're having this discussion now. What happens if my home catches fire and we are not enforcing an ordinance that the Board of Trustees voted on and approved? Can I hold you liable because it's not being enforced? In Colorado, the, the town of Wellington is covered by the Colorado Governmental Immunity Act. Um, you could sue the person who fired the fireworks, I'm sure. Um, but I think there's, the town has no, uh, again, I always hate saying anything really definitely, but I, um, uh, there is no, I've never heard of a case like that where the town would be held liable for something like that, for failure to pass an ordinance. So, is there a possibility for us to explore what is classified as a safe light site for families to actually come to a specific area? We have this in Nebraska um, around Lake McConaughey where families can actually come. Fire is there offering support, but there's a standard location with that support from fire where families can actually gather and light their fireworks off fire gets rid of any of the hazards. And that is one of those things we've done it in Ogallala and Oshkosh for years. So just trying to figure out if there is an even balance where we can one control the kind of fireworks that are being lit off, but to offer a place where families can go and some may not even want to light them off. Some might want to just go and sit and watch whomever is lighting them off. I know there's probably legal liabilities to address with it, but just something if we can look at later, I would love to. I'd have um, a, um, if the fireworks are prohibited by state law, then no. I mean, so we're still limited to the, the fire. Such a, such a program would still be limited to those fireworks designated as permissible fireworks under state law. Um, I would definitely have concerns with liability to the town, to its employees, and to a lot of people in such a situation. But um, I, it technically, yes, such a thing could be considered, but for a limited number of fireworks. Right. And I would not ask type, anyone to show up with mortar fire. shells. <laughs> um, so when I spoke with City of Fort Collins, they are enforcing and issuing immediate tickets. So do we have a generalized idea of how they are following that procedure to be able to issue those tickets? Is it something that can be looked into? Uh, and Fort Collins is a home rule municipality. So they have a considerably larger authority over criminal law and over a lot of other things. Um, so I would certainly, I would first question whether that's something we would even, whatever their law says is something we could even consider here. Um, but I'd be happy to, talk with folks over in, in the city of Fort Collins. I know some of their town attorneys or city attorneys. Um, we can talk with them about how they're doing that. But I think there's the first thing there is Fort Collins has a 
is a whole different animal when it comes to their authority. Got it. Um, so then I just kind of mimic what John had said. I would really like to see less warnings issued and I would like to see more actual citations given out. Um, this isn't new to anyone. This is something that has been in place since, gosh, was it 2002 is what I want to say. So I would really like to look at increasing the enforcement of the illegal fireworks, not permiss permissible. Um, my other thing is in section D, when you stated the Colorado law, you missed the hyphen 11 behind the code. So I didn't know if that was something that needed to be addressed or added. Actually, in section D, I specifically excluded the, the parentheses 11 because that section is not specifically talking about the list of permissible fireworks. Subsection 11 is only about permissible fireworks, and that's why it's specifically cited in A and B. My exclusion of that in D was, was intentional. So only this only speaks to the fireworks. It does not speak to what's allowed to be used or what's per, permissible. The term fireworks is just a definition. Under A, it says the maintenance, sale, purchase, transfer, gift, detonation, or use of any form of fireworks is prohibited in the town, except those are, that are permissible as defined with section 11. Then there are other sections there within B and C that specifically talk about fireworks generally. And so the reason there's a def then we use in D, it's a broader definition of fireworks, which just kind of clarifies the use of that word throughout. So D is a definitional item, and it's saying that when we say fireworks, we mean everything. However, in other sections of the proposed ordinance in A and B, where it talks about permissible fireworks, that is has a whole different definition that's in subsection or in paragraph 11. So uh, yeah, that's that was intentional. Got it. I don't have any more questions then. Uh, my only comment is that the only item that's actual right now is the ordinance that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of operational discussion that's going on that has nothing to do necessarily with this ordinance, other than that would be the ordinance that's being use so uh, just for a general so we can move forward on action items uh, if we could focus on that that'd be fantastic i think it would save us time but otherwise no comments because i agree with the ordinance that's written thank you is there any uh comments from the public regarding this agenda item oh, what reginald westfall again and uh I I did some research. How many minutes do I get? Only three, huh? Yes, sir. Okay, well, Bertha, Timnath, Severance, Windsor, Greeley, Loveland, Port Collins, Johnstown, Wellington. Okay. Everything except Wellington uh, goes by the state law and the penalties involved. Bertha, you get charged $26.50. In Fort Collins, you get charged twenty six fifty. In Loveland, five hundred and ten. In Greeley, five hundred. Uh, and in Tim Nath and Severance, the fine is going to vary depending on the judge. Every one of these towns uses a summons and they deliver it. So I don't know what the problem is with our town that we can't deliver summons. And when I found out that they were just given verbal warnings. <laughs> You got to be kidding! I mean, that is such a. I I I can't even hardly comment on that. That's ridiculous. I mean, uh, none of these towns do. And when I mentioned that to the to the people in these towns, uh, in in the government, why well, they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it, and they immediately uh, give a summons, and they and they find those people. And some of them are going to be put away. And in fact, the, that all the state laws uh, uh, are applied in all of these means they have to be a th uh, class three misdemeanor. That's, that's what it is. And anything that, and all of these use the same uh, uh, law that we've been referring to. 
And one, two, three, four, five, six, just make it real simple. If it leaves the ground, it's illegal. And that's what it says in the law, okay? So how is it hard for a deputy to determine what's going on? And another misconception is I keep hearing this, we can't determine who lit the fireworks. Well, the law says it's possession and firing of it. You got six canisters sitting right beside you on the, on the driveway, that's possession, okay? It, it's not about intent, it's possession because you can't have them to sell, you can't have them to blow up, et cetera. So forget this finding out, that's the crap they've been giving me saying they couldn't see who it was. I go next door on Wigwam and there's a whole street, man, they're lined up every single driveway and they got little kids that are maybe six years old out there and they're shooting these canisters. And I digress, but what I also wanted to mention, and I took a map, uh, I've been going down our whole, uh, well, forget it. I mean, it's obvious to me and this, and this ordinance itself, as it's written right now and you're gonna modify it, is essentially worthless for the town. And if you think that's gonna fly Thank with you. the people that are here, you're mistaken. Thank you. Christine Gator, just real quick. Um, I think we just need to enforce it more. Um, I don't think we need to raise the fine $500. It's a lot. And I'd like to yield the rest of my time to Reg if he would like to speak for yeah. some more. Yes, I would. And I might be wrong, but I have uh, quite a few reasons to believe that uh, I research this issue better than any staff. I don't know what staff is included here, but that's very upsetting to me. And the other thing I wanted to say is uh, what I found is that uh, uh, town code officers, code enforcement officers in these towns told the deputies and the police you better write those citations and, and bring those people in because we want to stop this. And maybe one of the reasons that uh, Bertha doesn't have much of a problem and the uh, uh, Larimer County uh, Sheriff's Office people can come up from there is because they got a nice stiff fine. You blow off anything down there and you're going to be paying for it. And same thing's going to happen in Fort Collins. Is there something funny about what I'm saying? Um, can we please keep this professional? Well, I'm just curious. I, I would like to keep it professional. Thank you. Okay. And as regards to uh, the calls, we had 76 calls in 2020. Uh, we had 30 in July of 2021. We don't have any totals for 21. We've had three so far this year. And what I have found in canvassing and talking to all the people in uh, Buffalo Creek, people give up calling. So how many calls you had is no idea of, of what's going on out there. And I have an issue with uh, uh, paragraph four, line three, based on town research of uh, court dockets, 2016 to 2022, no summons for a violation of town fireworks is issued. Well, no wonder they're given verbal ordings. So, so what, why is that in there? And, and ver for a variety of reasons, no citations or court summons have been issued. Well, we understand, we know why now. And warning is not sufficient. Paragraph seven, line four says, in many cases, a warning is sufficient. Well, I, that's not been the experience in anybody in uh, Buffalo Creek. And also, the residents tell me there's a number of uh, sheriff deputies that live in Buffalo Creek. And <laughs> the residents say the sheriff deputies don't even stop these big mega blasts. They line up chairs on the streets in these certain areas that I've delineated and everybody shoots off everything and they keep shooting them. And the other thing is they don't just shoot them on the 4th of July. And, and what we need in this ordinance is a time and day that you can shoot those. And I hope, I hope you do some more research, okay? Because 
you're way off base and, and I'm not gonna let this baby lie like it is. Thank you. I'm back, um, Jesse Andreen. I actually wasn't planning on speaking about this, but um, just to kind of illustrate his concerns, I have quite a few friends and family members that are veterans and they all are triggered by fireworks. And I've never lived in a town that has so many. Um, I get it, we're right over the, the Wyoming border. So it's kind of to be expected, but um, I'm typically not for more restrictions, but I do feel like in this instance, it is a lot in our town and I don't know how we will enforce it, but I hope that we can. Um, another thing, like even my, my old dog, like when it comes to this time of year, he's super anxious, like every night, just waiting for fireworks. So, you know, it is a problem, but that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Suzanne Burtis, um, I just want to say that my good neighbor tried to go around to Wigwam Way and politely asked the people to stop the fireworks and they laughed in his face. So if the constables or the sheriff can't determine who's doing this, and my neighbor can, where's the failure? Why aren't they getting summonses? This is insane. And like I said before, PTSD, it, it's not a good thing. And the fireworks set that off. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Karen Eifert. I live in the Mills. I don't know where the sign up list is. Um, I wanted to talk about, um, I guess, kind of a question as well is what kind of consequences happen to the town when they currently have an ordinance saying only sparklers and then the town and the so, law enforcement here don't uphold that. It's public comment once again. Uh huh. But I can say a question in public comment. It's yeah, okay. Yeah, it just can't. Yeah, okay. I'm good. Okay. Um, so um, also with the PTSD, I think you all know, and pretty much everybody in town knows that I have PTSD. <clears throat> so does my husband. And then we have two special needs children and my adult special needs brother. And they all three have autism and one of them has Down syndrome and autism. And we take the time to do things like go down to a shooting range and try out ballistic headphones so that my son can maybe tolerate part of that. So we make sure we park on the other side of town from where the fireworks are lit off at night. And that's the only one we go to. But he's wearing ballistic headphones. He's got earplugs in as well with those headphones. He's having to take uh, medication that his doctor prescribes as well as I'm the only one that can drive that night because everybody else is medicated so that my family can actually enjoy the 4th of July and not be so completely overwhelmed. But then I have to deal with meltdowns from all three of my uh, people with autism, my brother and my two children. They get extremely overwhelmed and they have a meltdown. I wanna point out that this town has a lot of families here that have autism and other um, significant behavioral disorders that would affect them with as things going on. So I don't know exactly what you're going to do with this ordinance, but I would please ask you to take the time and think about all of the population, not just the younger, not just the older, but include all of the population because there's so many people that have so many problems with this. And I really feel like at some point, the public deserves to know what can be done and why hasn't anything been done for so many years. It's just like saying, well, you can't park occur out in front of your house if it's not working and there's no driver's license plate on it and that's imposed by imposed by our code enforcer jim lafferty but so some things are enforced here in wellington but other things we'll just let go and let go for a multiple amount of years and i don't think that's right and i don't just think it's respectful and it's unfair to the people of wellington so whatever you do with this code i hope we get to have more public comment on that piece but i really consider it's not just one person saying, I don't, I don't like the amount. I don't like the fireworks being shot at my house either. I don't like that my husband's like, hey, let me get up on the roof and make sure everything's okay. He cannot be on the roof. He's got multiple sclerosis, so he shouldn't be doing that. But it's lots of people that are out on their roofs and afraid that their homes are going to burn down. So I don't know what the legal ramifications are, 
for a town and for the law enforcement in that town not to hold up an ordinance, but I think it's time that the public be let to know. Thank you. Thank you. Bring it back to the board for further comment. Trustee Keene. I think we achieved, you know, what we could do at this point of making an ordinance that's easier to enforce. And then the other items, the direction and the need for more enforcement, we've heard loud and clear, and we've communicated that to LCSO. So uh, I feel like we are doing what we can at this point. And then, but otherwise I have the plea to our community to be good neighbors. And that's really what would fix this problem, right? Is if people would be considerate of others. So that's that's my consideration. So I am in favor of this ordinance. Can I respond to a couple of questions that were raised by members of the public? Just for clarity for the board on a couple of issues. Um, Mr. Westfall listed a lot of towns and their ordinances and, and a lot of towns do simply say ordinance, uh, fireworks that are prohibited by the state are prohibited and, and that's what we're trying to do with this ordinance here. Um, other communities may have stiffer penalties. Um, severance for one says up to $750. Also says up to I think 180 days in jail. Um, in the town of Wellington, the fireworks ordinance is not a criminal offense. So jail time is not an option for violation of this ordinance. If that's something that the board wishes uh, would like us to explore, I, I would actually agree with Mr. Westfall that this needs more research. I mean, I'm one of the reasons we came up with the ordinance that we brought to the board today wasn't that this is going to cure the issue of fireworks in the town of Wellington forever and for good. Um, but in, in the short time we had, we thought this would be an opportunity to, 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 to present something right before 4th of July that could be enforced on 4th of July, um, maybe to increase enforcement. But I think there is a lot more research that can be done. I'm not saying that I would actually recommend criminal sanctions in municipal court. I think there are issues there. but. If any of those things the board wishes for us to to, to look at, it's gonna. I, I just need a lot more time. So that would be that would be my response there. Um, yeah. So uh, this is actually in line with a lot of other communities. I think the the penalties of five hundred dollars are pretty close. Um, some communities have this as a criminal offense. Some don't. So, but in the, the Wellington, it never has been. So we weren't trying to add jail time today. <laughs> Well, Mayor, if I may. Yeah, have at it. I think that just to take it back, the challenge that I continue to hear from the public and with the current ordinance is the enforcement issue. And as the ordinance is currently written, it is unrealistic and unfeasibly not, we, we can't enforce that realistically. We just, you There's can. too many options to enforce. Right. I mean, if you're, if you have something other than a sparkler currently, I mean, that, that, like, how would we logistically have enough sheriffs to write enough citations to address that? So what the current ordinance does is it provides a uniform standard for enforcement so that as we move forward and we continue to address and evaluate this significant concern to the community, we can address and research further what the best method of enforcement would be, whether that's through fines or criminal jail time. But I think that the issue at hand is the current ordinance is not feasibly enforceable. And what's being presented tonight is an op option for our current sheriff's office to start providing some enforcement and maybe provide feedback as to what feasible enforcement or the best plan of action might be moving forward. And I think that not having them here this evening, we're missing out on some of that valuable input yeah, too. We are. Yeah, we are. But we are coming up on the 4th of July. So I feel like we do have to address and consider the issue at hand. Thank you. Trustee Gator. I'll go. <laughs> um, so the main question that I have, because I, I agree this ordinance helps with fixing some of the, you know, if there was lack of clarity before, I think it makes it crystal clear and that's good. Um, the concern that I keep coming back to, and I think several people mentioned this, comes down to the enforcement. And so I guess there's two questions. Number one, are we as a legislative body able to mandate to LCSO as law enforcement that they are required to give a summons and they are not allowed to give warnings? Are we even able to do that? I'm going to answer that with a theoretically, I think, I, I think yes. I, I think there's some real... 
get back to practical issues, practical issues with saying that they have to issue citations. Right. I, mean, nope, I get that. Yep. With all of the, you can come up with a million examples of sure. times where it's like, well, I'm not sure that would be appropriate. I think there might be issues with their contract with LCSO that might need to be, I mean, okay. might be addressed, need to be addressed. If that's the direction and that is what we need to research, that's a long-term, give me some time to, to dig into how to, how to accomplish that. Um, you know, this was really brought to us two weeks ago. So um, that's a, that's a big change. I mean, but like I said, might, in, might include evaluating their contract with LCSO um, okay. and evaluating a lot of other things. And facilities. Does it, and facilities for LCSO. I think there's, there's a lot of factors there. Okay. If, you, if it's something the board would like us to, to look into, I'm, I'm happy to do that and if, as, a, as an option, but I just, two weeks was not sure. sufficient time to, to make such a drastic change to our relationship with our law enforcement. Okay. And if we were to try and require that, would that be something that would be done in an ordinance such as this, or would that be a completely separate thing that we have to come back to? It is would be a. I, I don't even I don't even have a good answer for that. Okay. Question. I mean, it is such mandating that they do something like that is I mean, it's hard to think of an example where okay. a law requires them to do something with absolutely no discretion. Okay. Like I said, in a situation where they pull up on a street and there's 20 people with 20 Roman candles sitting out there, and then nobody says or 20 mortars. Everybody says, I didn't have the lighter. Do they have to issue citations to all of those people? Because they all possessed sure. it. And if that is the case, like I said, that's going to come to municipal court and we're going to toss. Sure. We're going to waste their time writing the citation and they're going to, we're going to waste the court's time in tossing those cases because they're not, we can't prove the case in law. So I, there are a lot of issues there okay. that I don't necessarily would have a good answer of how that's okay. possible. Thank you. <laughs> Trustee Teets. So is there a possibility to move to adopt this at this time with an agreed upon date to revisit this exact topic where we actually can get feedback? If we have questions we need answers for, we can submit those to someone with the town and they can get those questions answered for us. So that way we have a more formed ordinance that specifically cites, as was explained, the, the Colorado, the state of Colorado statutes. Um, right now, it sounds like enforceability as far as us telling the police that they have to issue tickets, it might not be a possibility. Um, but if we can, adopt this with the Colorado State statues listed in it, but agree to a date that we are going to come back and revisit this. Is that possible at this time? Uh, I'm, I'm unclear what you mean by list the Colorado State statutes. Because uh, it already I, references the state statutes. I, I mean, I, I think I right, clarify. I think she's just saying, can we change it to where we state that we do revisit this at a certain date? Yeah. That part I can answer. I thought there was another, could we adopt this with this list? And so there's no no change to this proposed ordinance other than potentially a... No, it's specifically listed in here, the Colorado State statutes of what we have to, the rules we have to follow. Um, the stuff that has been blacklined, I actually see that in the Colorado State statute. It defines how many grams, what classifies a firework, um, the legality of it. So really, truly, this is stating that we have a state statute that we are following. As far as forcing enforcement, if we cannot get an answer from LCSO right now, is there a way to say we are going to address this at our next trustee meeting? We're going to bring questions we have. We're going to take feedback and questions from the public and actually give them answers they're looking for. I mean, I. I I personally think that we, I don't think we should set a hard date as the next meeting. I think this is going to take some time to get more logistics figured out. Got it. Dan, how um, long do you suspect that you'd need for this? Minimum, I would want, I don't think it's, it's worth uh, the board's time to consider anything until after the 4th of July and after, after the sheriff's office has had an opportunity to assess how the month of July to practice them with this. I, their I think, enforcement. I think at a minimum, we're talking the fall. Um, it would be my would be my recommendation because I think otherwise we're going to be coming back to the board and you're going to ask questions and we're going to say, well, we don't know quite how it went this year yet. So I, I think before we come back, it, it's well into the fall. 
like I would say August. I think September. we're like getting the step on the ladder and then we got to keep moving with this kind of deal. But this doesn't guarantee enforcement. So can we request additional coverage? Is that something we need to vote on? Request additional coverage from the sheriff's office. Mm -hmm. So this, I, we we have requested as much coverage as they can they can provide. They put out to their deputies. Uh, they, essentially, they have to have volunteers to get additional coverage here. And I should highlight um, there's been discussion of the number of calls that were made. Um, in the report, it says there were 57 calls responded to. That doesn't mean how many calls were made. And one of the issues that they face is with the number of deputies and reserve units that they bring into the town, the number of calls that they receive far exceeds their capacity to actually respond. And so often the calls for fireworks get bumped off the list because there's no point in responding to a fireworks call if they're an hour out. Um, I mean, so it's the, the quantity here is overwhelming. And if we're adding additional work to them, I think that's should be noted. But well, I, I'm not willing. Go ahead. You bring up a very valid point relative to that as well, because when we're talking about public safety on the 4th of July, I mean, do we want to be, they have a large scope of things that they need to be enforcing and looking at. And if they're we're prioritizing their time on fireworks, are they addressing DUIs? Are they addressing domestic violence? Are they addressing all of the other issues that come along with holidays? So if we want them to focus on just fireworks, they may not be addressing those areas to the level that we would like. I think if Sergeant Cherry were here, he would yeah. echo that sentiment. That's the reason for discretion. So right. that's and why they're trained in the way that they are. Well, we'll keep this in discussion. Trust me. I'll make it quick. Uh, I think this is a good start. It's a living document. We can change it. We do need to start uh, probably getting more specific on stuff. One thing I'd probably like to see, I used to live in Fort Collins, and even though it was kind of a light warning, they started putting up signs or whatever else that they're going to start enforcing this ordinance. Yes. And that got people thinking about, do I really want to start firing it off? I can get tickets. I can get fined. You might want to put up a billboard or something like that. So I think it's it would be good to get something out there just to warn the public that we're going to be a little stricter now. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that way it probably give the, uh, the sheriffs a little bit of teeth to what they can do too. So the warning's been out there. If they do it, they suffer the consequences. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the only thing odd about this ordinance, honestly, is that really, really all we're doing is bringing the town's code back in line with the state, which really really what we're doing if we're looking at this all, all we're doing is allowing more fireworks i'm not i'm not necessarily sure that that's what some of our residents intentions are however if the intention is to get us in line with state law i'm i'm fully behind that so uh, i think the question for me is obviously the, the verbal warnings are, are nonsense we we recognize that so i think the question is can we uh persuade lseo to give out written warnings as far as that goes. That gives us some kind of record as far as that goes. And if there's repeat offenders, then certainly we can take action on that type of thing. Um, but I do wanna make a point to something that Trustee McDonald had said in one of our work sessions, which is that I think we should be very careful about heavy handed government. Um, certainly, I don't think a first offender for fireworks deserves any type of jail time. That's certainly ridiculous and, you know, a thousand dollar fine is certainly up there. Certainly 500, maybe something like that's cool. But, um, and obviously we'll re revisit that down the road because it's not part of this ordinance. So that's, I've got it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm good. Hearing no further comments, I would like to seek a motion. Move to approve ordinance number 13, 2022. All second. May I get a roll call? Trustee Wiegand? Yes. Trustee Gator? Yes. Trustee Kenny? Yes. Trustee Mason? Yes. No, not as it is. Mayor Pertin McDonald? Yes. Mayor Shosi? Yes. Vote passes with a six. One yes vote.
our last action item is a resolution number 22-2022, a resolution approving the Colorado Regional Opiate Intergovernmental Agreement for the Larimer County Region and appointing a representative from the town of Wellington to serve on the Larimer Regional Opiate Council, Mr. Sapienza. In November of last year, the Board of Trustees approved a resolution um, uh, signing on to the Colorado MOU that was put out by the Attorney General's office. This was a settlement of the lawsuits filed by many municipalities, counties, and other government entities against manufacturer of opioids for the damages that they have caused to communities. Um, the settlement was structured in Colorado through the Attorney General's office so that all of the money flowed to the state and then down from there to various regions based on a large number of factors. Wellington is a small community, but is a community of over 10,000 residents. And per the MOU, any community over, or actually per the whole settlement agreement, any community over 10,000 residents could sign on to the settlement agreement, gaining access to the funds from the settlement agreement, um, as long as they signed that they will not sue again. So we basically signed on to the settlement, even though Wellington had never actually filed a lawsuit. So we kind of got wrapped into it. As part of that settlement run through the Attorney General's office, they created the State Abatement Council, and then there are Regional Opioid Abatement Councils. Wellington, again, as a community of over 10,000, is a full signatory to the MOU and then onto all of this. And so the intergovernmental agreement in front of you is for the Larimer County Regional, we have a couple names, but I forget what we eventually settled on, but the Larimer County Regional Opioid Abatement Council, which is the town of Wellington, the city of Loveland, the city of Fort Collins, Larimer County, and the Larimer County Board of Health. The reason those entities have, are the five entities on there is they have over 10,000 residents and per the agreement, the community health department is, uh, is a member of the IGA uh, per the state agreement. Um, other communities actually will receive funds or receive some of the benefit of these funds. But what the regional council is intended to do is it will receive probably about $20 million over the next 20 years. And that council of five members will decide where those funds are used. So it's a really cool opportunity for the town of Wellington to have a, a strong voice in how all of, Welling, or all of Larimer County's opioid dollars will be spent. Wellington does get its own local government share. And if you read through the IGA, it talks about the regional share and the local participating government share. Um, per the IGA, I believe Wellington's share uh, is 0.35%, whereas Fort Collins and Loveland get about 51% or 21% each, and the county gets 51%. Um, that, that teeny tiny percentage was determined by the state based on population, services provided, and, and a number of other things. So, and also it was pegged to, I believe, 2015. So even though now we're over 10,000 in 2015, we weren't. So Wellington itself gets a very tiny percentage of these dollars, but as a member of this regional council, gets a very large vote equal to Fort Collins, Loveland, and Larimer County in how the larger pool of money, which is the regional dollars are spent. So this IGA uh, has attached to it bylaws. The really what we're what I'm asking is uh, the resolution is for approval of the IGA itself. The bylaws are there intended as something to get it going, um, and those will all be changed by the organization later. So if you have questions on the specific language, I would say the bylaws that are presented absolutely can be changed once we get in there. The IGA can be changed down the road, um, but it's been agreed to and already adopted by the city of Fort Collins, Loveland, um, Larimer County, and I believe by the Board of Health as, as well. So part of this is also appointing a representative and a alternate representative um, in the resolution. Those individuals will serve for two years or until they're no longer no, I think it's for two years or until the board decides they're, this board decides they're not serving. Those individuals have to be employees of the town that would include elected officials, so. Are there any comments or questions from the board of trustees? Trustee Mason. 
I feel really fortunate that we get to be involved in this. So I am definitely in favor of participating. Trustee Gator. Yeah, so I just had a quick question um, just reading through. And I know, Dan, you mentioned some of this is, is probably with the the wording of the bylaws. This is the word I'm looking for. Um, so I, I know you, you and I have already talked about these, but I did want to bring them in just so they could be highlighted. Um, does the IGA have any impact on, I know we can't sue because we signed on to that, but does this impact private parties in any way? Absolutely not. Perfect. Um, it does not impact their ability to sue opioid manufacturers. This is the town settling a lawsuit that the town wasn't actually involved in. Great. Um, the other question is just in part of that is non-compete agreements and things or conflict of interest stuff saying you can't work with certain people. Would this limit us as a town's ability to just do our regular business by signing on to this IGA that we would no longer be able to work with companies we previously worked with for other things? No, and that's actually, I mean, that is a concern that any of the municipalities um, involved in this would have. So if, if, if something came up where there was a question, I, I would tell you that all of the signers onto this would say, let's change that. <laughs> that absolutely not the intent. And, and from what I've seen, it's, that would not be effect either. Okay. And then there is uh, on there with administrative fees, there's like a 10% max or actual cost for administration of this funds. Um, is there a ability to limit that to be, to be lower and actually have more money going towards services versus administration? That 10% number, you know, as part of this, one entity has to sign on as the fiscal agent and Larimer County opted to sign on. That means Larimer County is gonna be accounting for every dollar. There's a large number of administrative costs that they will have. So they propose up to 10%, it does say actual cost. That's something that I think if we sign on to this entity that could be limited potentially by the bylaws. So on a, on a, a vote of the council, it, step one would be join the council. <laughs> and then step two, if that was a concern to the okay. desire to lower that could be brought up then. Perfect, no further questions. Yeah, I had, I received an email regarding a question about this and I wanted to verify it. Um, this is from a resident. It states, to my understanding, item number seven has funding allocated towards it already because other cities, towns, and Larimer County, oh, sorry, apologies, that was me. So also regarding item number seven on the agenda, the trustees are being asked on behalf of the citizens of Wellington to join a county anti-drug group to fight drug problems in Larimer County. This council was created due to the fact that a bad moral choice of using drugs in turn causes addictions, marital breakups, theft, suicide, homelessness, and murder. On one hand, you will possibly be voting to bring street law, street drugs, lawlessness, and crime to the city, creating a need to pay for more police officers while the other hand, wasting more tax money by belonging to a council charged with helping eliminate the problems that the drug culture creates. We request that in the future, you do whatever you can to stop drugs from coming into our community and vote no on both agenda items number three and number seven. Sorry, this is also one of the ones that was sent to me about the previous thing we put off till a later date. So my understanding is, is this money has already been allocated. It's been given. They're not removing more tax dollars, correct? This is the amount that was offered to Larimer County for the regional task force of funding that's already been. First of all, none of this is tax dollars. Okay. Zero percent so, of the funds it. being administered by this council are tax dollars. These are money that is being provided. This is money from manufacturers of opioids in settlement of the billions of dollars lawsuits um, for the harms caused by opioids. That money is going to the state, which is then providing it to the regional, regional entities. Not a single penny of this is tax dollars. The other thing you said is this money has already been allocated. Uh, we're actually, this is a global settlement of all claims against opioid manufacturers now and continuing. So it is actually impossible for anybody to say how much money this is actually going to be uh, because the money has not been allocated. I think only one or two of those cases have been fully settled, but any of those cases as they get settled with the state and with the attorney general's office get wrapped into this. So there's kind of an indefinite amount of money, but not a single penny of it is tax dollars. 
Got it. So to understand, we cannot go after this money again after this. If we don't sign on to this, we have no say in how the money is spent and we will not get a local share of it. This, this is not, the town has already signed on to the MOU. If we mm -hmm. now do not sign on to this IO, IGA, we actually probably need to unsign on to, uh, from the MOU that was adopted in November, which removes dollars from the town that is coming from these settlements. And it removes the ability of the town to have any say in how any of this money is spent. Awesome, thank you. I just wanted to, in case that person is watching, I wanted them to have a, an answer. And, and they actually said also um, something about removing drugs from the streets and fighting the prime. What's, this council has a pretty broad mandate on abatement of opioids. The, the definition of the projects that can be funded by this is huge. And so there's, there's a lot of great opportunity for the community for all around Larimer County to benefit from this um, in, a, in a variety of ways, so. How much will we actually be getting out of this? About a million, is that right? The, the, town of of the total settlement here. For, yeah. for the town of Wellington? Right. So. Uh, the town of Wellington's total settlement out of the local government share is probably somewhere <laughs> on the high end, I'd say around $30,000 okay. over 20 it. years. Well, Wellington's share is infinitesimally small. Okay. The, the benefit of this is the access and the control over where the larger regional dollars are, which is like $20 million that's sent to the region, not distributed to each municipality. So, yeah, uh, well, the settlement, where the settlement's going to keep kind of coming in over years, but the amount of money coming directly to Wellington is this big, but the amount of money that's coming to the region that this entity controls is actually a pretty good size. And we need all the help we can get right now. And it'd be nice for a uh, representative from the town of Wellington to be sitting on that council helping to you betcha. say, don't forget us up here. Mayor Pro Tim. Hey, I think I think it's wonderful for us to be asked to the seat of the table, um, start having a say in the community. One um, item on this is the that there is a appointment that needs to be made. Yeah. So, um, I mean, do you guys want to discuss who to appoint while we're sitting here? I mean, we, we are going to be doing that with this resolution. Um, I have talked to Dave and I have both talked to, or Trustee Mason and Trustee Wigan. Um, Mason would, I think, would be great at it. Um, personally, do you guys agree with that? I think that would be wonderful. Um, town staff wise. No need for us to be involved. You just need the appointment. As an alternate. I have as, to have as, an alternate. As an alternate. I would recommend a staff member be an alternate. Okay, staff member. That, yeah. It can be me. <laughs> <laughs> I seem to follow in those alternate roles, which is just fine. Okay. And Trustee Mason, just don't miss any meetings, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, are there any public comments regarding this agenda item? No. Okay. Any final comments from the board? Okay. Hearing no further comments, I would like to seek a motion. So I'd like to move to approve resolution number 22-2022. And that is a resolution approving Colorado Regional Opioid Intergovernmental Agreement with for the Larimer County region in appointing a representative from the town of Wellington. That would be trustee Brian Mason to serve as the representative and then town administrator Patty Garcia to serve as the alternate to serve on the Larimer Regional Opioid Council. I'll second. May I get a roll call? Trustee Kenny? Yes. Trustee Mason? Yes. Trustee Teets? Yes. Trustee Wiegand? Yes. Trustee Gator? Yes. Mayor Fritzer McDonald? Yes. Mayor Shosi? Yes. Mr. Zapienza, do you have any reports? I do not, Ms. Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Garcia, any reports? No report tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any reports from staff? Sergeant Chair is not here. Are there any reports from the board? Sorry, Trustee Teets. 
Didn't we have a presentation from Steph? That was sent in our packet. Um, so yes, Sergeant Cherry was going to give a presentation, but he is not here. So no. um, the only other the other only other report was provided by Nathan Ewart, and it was just a written report in your packet. It wasn't a verbal report. Oh, got it. Apologies. I thought there was a presentation applied to it. I have nothing at this time. I don't want to repeat myself too much, but I did want to congratulate all of the Wellington students on transitioning and upgrading and having an opportunity to attend that graduation and promotion ceremony today was a beautiful prequel to what the community is in store for with our new middle school, high school. So it was a thank you for the opportunity to attend that this evening with my family. It was very important and to be there representing the board in our local school system this evening. So thank you so much. That was a really, really amazing opportunity. Yeah. Trustee Mason. Um, Mr. Sapienza, I might need your advice on this one. Um, motion for reconsideration. Can I make that now? Order for the dates. Um, while he's looking that, while he's while he is looking that up, um, it is hitting the 10 p.m. mark, and I know you all had talked about ending your meetings at 10 p.m. We do have two executive sessions scheduled for tonight, which are not incredibly time sensitive. We could probably postpone those if you requested that. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. <laughs> okay, I stalled a little bit. I have something if we need more time. Okay. Uh, I had the honor of attending the Boys and Girls Club of Larimer County Soiree um, last Friday, uh, where we celebrated and did fundraising for the for the entire Larimer County Boys and Girls Club. What I think was really special, though, is there was an award given of the champion for children for the year. There's one recipient each year. You might remember last year, our own Mary and Bert McCaffrey won for their uh, dedication to the Boys and Girls Club of Larimer County for I think 19 years of a golf tournament fundraiser that they've done. What's really cool is the following year, this year, um, Wellington was also recognized from the service of Darren and Rona uh, Robert, how do you say that, Robertson, um, in their donation to the Sage Homes Boys and Girls Club for Wellington. Um, about a half a million dollars in coordination with many other um, groups in the in the community. So I, I'm just really proud of the Boys and Girls Club of Larimer County. They do amazing work. They talked about a bunch of their achievements and some of the amazing things that they're planning going forward and how many kids they served in Larimer County. Um, Wellington, even though we're a small community, we get a very high proportion of those services here because we have a lot of children served. And we obviously have a very dedicated community, two years in a row of Wellington winners um, of this major award for the entire county. So I wanted to say thank you again to those winners, of course, um, and their amazing contributions to Wellington. So I wanted to mention that it was a great event too. It was at the ranch, so that was cool. Cold on the ice, but, but it was fun. <laughs> So a motion to reconsider is in order. Um, there's, per Robert's rules, it's on the same day or during the same session. And due to local government, it's the next, the, the following meeting. So it would be in order at this meeting for you to, uh, I assume it's on the Water Now Alliance and you didn't state that clearly expressly, but uh, we'd be in order at this meeting. However, we are past the time on the agenda for main motion consideration. This is the time for board reports. So. I'm looking at Robert's rules, 3715. I, I don't know if this is actually a bad thing because for 
couple technical reasons related to the open meetings law, but I believe under 3715, it's calling up a motion to reconsider at a later time. So essentially there would be a motion, you could make a motion to reconsider that could be seconded now, but then it would essentially have to be tabled to a later time. I, like I said, I don't necessarily mind that because under the Open Meetings Act, a motion to reconsider this item now, that's in order or that's appropriate, but actual discussion of the underlying motion would have to be done at a later time anyway, because we'd have to get it on the agenda. So we have this conflicting thing where the agenda has to be set in advance by the Colorado Open Meetings Law so because it is not in order at this time to consider a main motion, it is appropriate to make a motion to reconsider. It can be seconded, but then we would delay taking that up until a subsequent meeting, which also would offer an opportunity to give public notice, put it on the agenda and, and have a full discussion of that with the underlying motion all in one fell swoop. So that would be my... That would be my interpretation of it is appropriate to make the motion if you would like to make the motion and it's seconded, but then it needs to be considered at a later time. All right, well, here we go. Um, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion and Mayor Shosi, if you'd like to hear any board comments on the merits of the reconsideration before we go to a vote, I'll let you decide how you wanna handle that. But otherwise, I'd like to make a motion to reconsider the adoption of the Water Now Alliance Project Accelerator Grant mem Memorandum of Understanding for the meeting on June 14th. I'll second the motion. Should I not set a date? Trustee Mason, uh, you don't need to set a date, but you can. And we will, I think uh, for agenda purposes, that's appropriate. Trustee Mason, in making your motion, you need to put on the, say on the record, how you voted on the preceding motion. Yeah, and I did vote yes on your, to, sorry, I apologize. I voted no to uh, turn the grant down. Which was the prevailing side. Which was the prevailing side, that's correct. And I will second Trustee Mason. No. That motion has now been made. It that, is debatable, correct? On the merits to reconsider. I, I would, we now should consider the motion to reconsider at another time. Okay. Well, um, it's... Uh, if a motion to reconsider involves a main motion cannot be taken up when it is made, it's called up and act upon where no question is pending, no other members on the floor. The motion to reconsider may be called up at any meeting in the same session. So essentially you've made the motion, but it's not actually in order at the exact this moment because we're past the time on this agenda for consideration of motions and main items. So it stays as an open motion until the next meeting basically? Mm -hmm. Kind of, it stays floating out there until it's called up at a later meeting. And like I said, I think that's actually a, a good thing because okay. of the open meetings law. Okay. It's, it's an odd oh. one. Now, a roll call? No, no there's no vote there's, on this item. Is it the motion? <laughs> so in reading here, you have to have a super majority vote of two thirds of the quorum present is required for approval for that motion. So we still have to motion approve to bring it back, correct? The, are you reading in Bob's rules? This is an item that there aren't many of them but this is an item that there is an express contradiction between Bob's rules and Robert's rules. There's not. It specifically states it right here. Bob's rule says supermajority. Correct. Robert's and that's what Robert's, we follow. Robert's rules is a majority. And per the discussion last week at the meeting, where there is a conflict, Robert's rules supersedes. That was the discussion at the work session last week. And this is one of those items I know of two um at this point and this was I had to do some research to find this one um but the the of the the bigger question is there is no vote at this time so um the the, the vote takes place at a later time when it is called up the motion has been made but there is no consideration of the motion to reconsider until a later time because it's not a not in order right now under 3715 of robert's rules if so there, once it's on an agenda item, then it goes to the vote. And then what we'll do, what we can do simple. is put it on an agenda item for consideration of the item. But then the first thing that has to be done before there's consideration of the underlying item is the motion to reconsider is brought up and discussed and fully voted on at that time. Okay. So like I said, this gives the opportunity, if a motion to reconsider were actually passed tonight, there couldn't be then discussion of the underlying motion because that would violate the Colorado Open Meetings Law, even though it would be compliant with Robert's rules. So we have to follow state law where we, um, so in this case, this gives the opportunity to 
not take up the motion to reconsider now. It can be called up at a later date and we can put it on the agenda and have public comment and do the whole thing. Um, I think it's a, I think that's a good result under the open meetings law. Um, I don't, mm -hmm. don't like anything that's not on the agenda. <laughs> I disagree. And that's a point of appeal. So at the end of the day, it says a supermajority vote, but then in the next paragraph, in the event of a successful motion for reconsideration, it is recommended that the reconsideration of the original matter be continued to a future date. So it clearly states there's no conflict in this understanding as what it is to actually be able to bring a motion to reconsider. And it also states that it is very, you have to tread very lightly on the items that you choose to bring for a motion to reconsider because of the fact that it takes this, the super majority. Because if that was the case, then every single item that gets voted on, we could just keep challenging each other and wasting people's time. And that defeats the purpose of what a super majority is. So there's no contest when it comes to it. That's not conflicting. It specifically states here. Robert's Rules of Order 12th edition and all preceding editions expressly states that a motion to reconsider requires only a majority vote, regardless of the vote necessary to adopt the motion to be reconsidered. That is a direct conflict between Robert's Rules and Bob's Rules. Um, I, I, I know exactly what you're reading, and I've read that. Ex I, 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 mm -hmm. I know what you're reading. Um, I'm not saying that you were wrong in what you were reading. I am saying that there is a conflict between the two. And Robert's Rules of Order was adopted into the town code. Has been, it, it, is, it is the rules of order that govern board meetings per the law of the town of Wellington. Bob's Rules was adopted by resolution, which by its very nature cannot supersede the law of the town. A resolution cannot supersede that. So we use Bob's rules to the extent that it clarifies Robert's rules, but it, it cannot override it. So we're gonna continue to enforce that throughout from that, now on. Where there is a conflict, that's- Got it. Where there's a direct conflict. I, I think Bob's rules is a very valuable thing for most of our most of our proceedings, but where there is a direct conflict, I, I believe that's what was stated at the work session um, last week. Do we need a motion to move those other items to another meeting? The, the executive sessions, yeah. the remaining items here. Yeah. Um, I usually don't call an executive session. Oh, okay. An executive session is, by, its, by its nature has no action taken. So if okay. we don't want to call an executive session, we can move those items. Yeah. Okay. So a question of clarification, is this the reason you had us answer this at our last work session was so this could be brought? Who are you asking? Just the board in general, because it had come up in our work session and was represented. Is that the reason it came up when it did? No, uh, I would say there are a number of things that I learned specifically after the fact that I would like the board to understand when we consider this on June 14th. Any further questions? Okay. I, let's see. I, I do not have any reports. Do you have any reports? Did I already ask you? <laughs> okay. Um, so I motion to adjourn with no further business. Second. Can I get a roll call, please? Trustee Gator. Yeah. Trustee Kenny? Yes. Trustee Mason? Yes. Trustee Teets? Yes. Trustee Wiegand? Yes. Mayor Pertan McDonald? Yes. Mayor Shosky? Yes. But you're gone. Enjoy. Have fun. Good for you. I actually turned off my work.